Money. You sound like a Lebanese merchant. Adam Curry, John C. Devora. It's Sunday, January 6, 2019. This is your award-winning Give Our Nation Media Assassination, episode 1101. This is No Agenda. Foaming at the mouth and broadcasting live from the capital of the Drone Star State here in downtown Austin, Tejas, in the Clutio in the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where it's raining, it's raining, it's global warming. I'm John C. Devora. It's Craig Vaughn and Buzzkill in the morning. <laughs> Boy, it's raining. Oh, my goodness. What are you going to do in California? I don't know. I've never seen anything. It's water pouring out of the sky. It's, it's the end. It's a global warming it's, apocalypse. It's all, we, look, we know. Since uh, 1849, people have been writing about the hellhole that is California. Yep. Nothing new. Nothing new. <laughs> and we missed the Zephyr? Second, uh, second, only by a split second. Second show of the of the year. Already missing the Zephyr. Well, I hear that Zephyr coming. It's rolling around the bend. <laughs> oh my God! Woo! Listen to that horn! I mean, you've inspired people, John. You inspire people. Hello. Hello? <laughs> I said you inspire people and you were just very quiet. I was laughing. Oh. So who was it with the Johnny Cash voice? Oh, that's uh, who do you think it is? It is it is our d- drunken uh It's Chris? Yes. He Chris did a, can do that voice? Man, he did a whole end of show song for us. Wow. And uh let's see Matt did this one. Don't see tells us the status of the <laughs> <laughs> you know, long after we are gone, these songs will still be floating around the internet. And yeah, they won't figure, no one will know why. <laughs> <laughs> be like, wow, man, 2019, back in the day, those guys were weird. <laughs> or weirdos. And what is this Zephyr they keep talking about? Come on, let's get back in my flying car. Yeah, that'll be the day. Yes, yes. Uh, before we start, we have travel advisories from the United States State Department. Uh, issues yes. travel warning for Americans going to China. Be careful. But also travel advisory for Italy. Terror advisory, no less. Oh, yeah? Terrorist groups continue plotting possible attacks in Italy. Terrorists may attack with little or no warning. That's kind of how it works. There was a massive terror attack in Italy that affected the tourists. I think I, you know, I sent this to Willow, who lives in Florence, outside, actually Fiesole, outside of Florence, and she said, "Oh, this is because of our our a hole government. They're putting fear into everybody, and somehow that's trickling up or through or whatever." That's what she said. She says this uh, makes no sense. But doesn't I, make sense at all. But I, I do like how the State Department formulates it. Terrorists may attack with little or no warning. Really? This is a revelation. Yeah. I've always <laughs> thought that they gave lots of warning, told people what the neighborhood was going to be and they were gonna, when they were going to attack, how they were going to attack, and what day. They may be targeting tourist locations, trans- transportation hubs, marketing or shopping malls, markets or shopping malls, local government facilities, hotels, clubs, restaurants, places of worship, parks, major sporting and cultural events, educational institutions, airports, and other public areas. When was the last time in Italy that any of those places were targeted by terrorists? I don't know. I don't know. Never? Mm, well, they've had stuff go on in Italy. They've had problems. Yeah, that's usually they haven't blown up a church. Hmm. Places of worship, yeah, maybe a mosque. Yeah, well, that's also a place of worship. Yeah, well, hmm. I mean, it I mean, counts. that would be a target for some of the terrorists who hate the other sect. Ah, but <clears throat> I'm not buying it. <sighs> well, I found this week to or this weekend to be a little tougher even than Christmas, as people still were just really weren't quite back and. You know, there was well, there's, I think there's a lot of people on furlough, and the po- I went to the post office to get the mail. There's like five pieces there instead of the usual 10 mm. or 15. Oh, so we're suffering again. Yes. Checks. And, uh, but, I mean, it comes eventually. Let me, let me just get this right. So the furlough, or the sh- partial shutdown, as it's called, um, is hurting the show directly. Yeah, I think so because people get. There are people that listen to this show that's that donate. Yep. 
They yep. get a check and in they fact, take a piece of, we they probably have, when they, We probably have more government listeners than we realize. Probably. And yes. probably more of them not donating than we realize. Um, I don't know. It probably is a little bit. But I think what, I don't think it's just the, the direct connection. I think a lot of it's just the, the overall connection because of the slow down of everything and they're trying to snap out of the right. holiday season and all that sort of thing. Right. Uh, the DC girl who would know says payroll goes in on the 9th and payday is or is not the 11th. So that's that's when uh, that's the real date when it starts to get difficult for people. Ah. I, I must say well, I, Trump says it could go on for years. <laughs> that's not exactly what he said. I watched his <laughs> I watched his Rose Garden appearance, which I thought was one years. of his I thought one of was it was one of his better appearances. He was very calm. Um, he was reasonably coherent. He didn't have a lot of the hey, hey, world thing, but me bleh. He didn't have a lot of that. Uh, took questions, did another one of those fun. Hey, you know, should I keep asking you? Want, I, you got more questions? Should I keep this going a little bit? You guys like it? He even uh, threw a question to, um, ah, what's her name from the, uh, the black radio network. I have no not, idea. Not Anna Navarro, but the other one, ah, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, you do. Oh, this just oh, happening uh, more oh, often. Oh, Joy? Joy no, Reed? no, no, she's MSNBC. No, from the, the, uh, April Ryan. Oh God, the worst. Yes. And she had, she had a, an okay question and he said, Oh, good question. He was like, <laughs> it was like, he was happy. Everyone was nice. And. And he was, uh, kind of, although as I'm watching, so I'm watching it, I'm thinking in my head, he's bringing in, so first of all, we just kind of changed the wall to, it can be steel, it's American steel. Barrier. Barrier, yeah. but steel, so it'd be good for American companies. Okay, interesting. And then he brings DACA back in. He literally said, I want people to come in and have a pathway to citizenship. We need the people. He said all these things. And I'm thinking, maybe this wall, maybe this... Five point six billion, five billion is just is just kind of an. Oh, maybe he's going for a full immigration deal. Eh, who knows? It just it just kind of hit me like is this guy going for something bigger? No one's going to anal- analyze it correctly. Whatever he's up to, he uh, in his uh, Rose Garden statement, he did make it very clear he has a he has his fallback position. Please, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Go ahead. So first. Let me know when you get tired. (laughs) I'm not. Uh, Have you considered using emergency powers to grant yourself authorities to build this wall without congressional approval? And second, on Mexico, you have. Yes, I have. And And I can do it if I want. So you don't need congressional approval to build the wall? No, we can use them. Absolutely. We can call a national emergency because of the security of our country. Absolutely. No, we can do it. I haven't done it. I may do it. I may do it. But we could call a national emergency and build it very quickly, and uh, it's another way of doing it. But if we can do it through a negotiated process, we're giving that a shot. So is that uh, a threat hanging over the Democrats? I never threaten anybody. All right. He only promises. Since when? (laughs) But the best part. And if I had had a beverage in my in my between my lips, it would have been spewing throughout the uh, throughout the common law condo. And it kind of fits in with this Trump, the stock whisperer, because whenever he says, oh, well, you know, you might want to buy. I don't know. I think it was just a glitch in the system. It's, you know, the, the market went up a thousand points the, mark, the trading day after he said that. Do you recall he was saying was, he was pissed off about the price of oil? Yeah, well, he's done that a number of times. Well, he, he addressed this specifically in his Rose Garden uh, speech. No, no. All of this stuff is changing now. This is a fair deal. This is a good deal for Mexico. Uh, frankly, oil companies and other companies have an incentive now to go to Mexico and take oil out. And that's why we're keeping gasoline prices so low. You look at what's going on with gasoline prices. I mean, it's rather incredible. If you look back four months ago, oil hit $83 a barrel. 83. It was heading to 100, and then it could have gone to 125. You want to see problems? Let that happen. After I made some phone calls to OPEC and the OPEC nations, which is essentially a monopoly, all of a sudden it started coming down. I'm very happy with what's happened, and I'm very happy that people are paying a lot less in many cases than $2 a gallon for 
gasoline. You look at what's happening. Everyone's talking about it. didn't happen by luck. It happened through talent. <laughs> <laughs> talent, man. That's talent. <laughs> And I believe it in this case. I totally believe that. I believe whatever talent he has, he pulled it together and said, hey, 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 hey. this whole Khashoggi thing, let's start by lowering the price. <laughs> let's bring that down a bit. You guys are pissing me off. I just thought it was funny, talent. I got I to gotta learn how to say that myself. That show isn't just good because. It's because talent. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to pull off. He does it, and the way he does it, it's like, a, you know, it's, 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 like the, it's like a kicker. At the end of a, of a, of a at the end of a joke. no the end of a no agenda clip is that's it's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, that was a good clip. I didn't oh, hear that. Yeah, uh, uh, it was very very funny. Do you have any wall clips? Do you have anything? I got a couple related I any wall clips. You know, it's just like the, I thought the wall was tedious. Uh, Morehouse action. Can... Well, here I so I got any, I got nothing. So he started he started this. Mm, on well, I guess Friday, and did it, his first ever appearance in the uh, briefing room. First ever appearance in the briefing room. Oh, he's it, but by the way, I want to point something out. This was I think I may have a clip about that, but this was pointed out by every. This is more important than anything that these these networks and d- democracy now and the rest of them all the same. It's like oh my god, it's the first appearance ever. <laughs> Ever. And I'm thinking, I don't believe that's true, but okay, let's say it is. And then they said he just he just told the press what he wanted to tell him. He says he called the briefing and he told them what he wanted to tell him. And then he didn't take any questions. What kind of a briefing is that? It's a briefing. And you're not taking any questions at all. All right. That was the first briefing room appearance of President Donald Trump. So significant for that factor. However, he also, he did not take questions. I want to discuss this with my panel. Let's discuss we saw the questions. him with members of this union, the National <laughs> National Border Patrol Council, which endorsed him uh, in, during the campaign. So these are current and retired Border Patrol agents, right? These right. represent right. Border Patrol right. agents. It's, not, it's not the Border Patrol, it's, not, it's, a, it's, it's a union, just it's to fake. be clear. Uh, and he has them behind him, but it's just pulling the spotlight back to the White House and to his point of view, but it's he, he didn't even take questions. Oh. No, but it doesn't really no. explain. I oh. think if the Democrats can make their point, and they didn't probably can with Speaker Pelosi there, they'll just say... Maybe Bill Crystal, this guy has fallen so low to be sitting on the panel discussing whether the oh, president yeah, he, he took questions. Oh, Fine, let's have this. We have a continuing resolution for the Department of Homeland Security for a month. We will debate the border issue. Meanwhile, we have these six other agencies of the federal <laughs> government that you are closing down and holding hostage, and we're willing to pass bipartisan appropriations bills for those. I, I think it's a very hard argument for yeah, Republican but, but, senators but to resist, as I said he, before. But, Donald but, Trump can resist it by not addressing it, right? It's right, just, it, here are these border right, patrol guys, right, right. and we need a wall. Thank you. Yeah. To be clear, this is basically a, this is a stunt. Oh, I mean, this yeah. isn't a briefing. So we thought there was going to was <laughs> a, 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 a last-minute briefing. A briefing. That, <laughs> that was not a briefing, right? A briefing right, is questions. Right? A briefing is questions. You heard it here no, first. not. That's questions and answers. That's a briefing is questions. Why are you arguing with Bria, Brian? Don't argue with her. She's the worst. A briefing is questions. You don't even know who she is. <laughs> you have no idea. Am I wrong? Here's my question regarding this. If, it's re- if, re- if, if uh, so much of the country is really up in arms about this and really, Wait. really wants this wall, which may or may not be true. But Wait, if- before you go on, before you go on, I want to stop. And and read you the definition of, a of the word briefing. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Does it include questions? No. Oh. A meeting for giving information or instructions. That's one. Two, the actions of informing or instructing someone. It's nothing to do with questions and answers, press conference, nothing like that. It's a briefing. And everybody, including that clip you have, was up in arms about this. A last minute briefing. That that was not a briefing, right? A briefing is a questions. Briefing. <laughs> right. A briefing is questions. <laughs> yeah. No. So that's all they could argue about is whether it was a briefing or not. It was uh, interesting. But I'm thinking if people really want this, we apparently have the capability in America to mobilize millions of people with pussy hats and you know, we can get people on the streets and they go down to D.C. How come this doesn't happen for something as incredibly as important as the wall? 
Wh- why isn't that happening? I see well, are we not- getting pussy hats? <laughs> That's almost my question. I mean, is it only the left with pussy hats who can organize? Is the right? Well, the left is the ones who go out in the streets. Well, why doesn't the right do that? If it's if it's They've if it's life or that. death. When the right does when the right does that, uh, as and and case in point would be the Tea Party. They actually would go out into the street. They tend to be elderly or older. Yes. Uh, and there are young ones in that group, but then they start. Does they go out in the street with any sort of signs that are, that they even reflect? mirror reflect the kind of signage that they have on the left they're called a bunch of nazis and that's and why they don't want to go it down so they can't go do yeah, anything but, like the, that but the left it's, it's own- but the left are then called an antifa by the right i mean they, you can make an argument they call both themselves ways. antifa yeah you're right well i just think if it's life or death people would take to the streets i'd hope they would but they're not so you just got to wonder. When right, actually, the, when the conservatives and right, the old farts and everybody else takes to the streets for over something, it's not going to be pretty. Look, this wall issue is 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 about two things. One is just not giving Trump what he campaigned on. That's definitely part of it. And yeah, the other it's leverage for twenty twenty. It's it's also leverage for a real immigration deal which includes some pathway to citizenship which the democrats desperately want that's that is that's what that's their position and trump was talking about this in his speech he's saying look uh well first of all put more money into the um, into the regular ports of entry where people are overstaying their visas which i hope would mean an exit uh, stamp which is what every country in the modern world has to track if people ever left uh, and he's talking about pathway to citizenship. I think something much bigger may come out of this. And it, I never, I don't know who this person is. Sherry Bustos. She's apparently congresswoman from uh, Democrat for Illinois. Have you ever don't heard know. of her? I've never heard of her. Well, no. she is also the chairperson of the DCCC. And she explains what that is in this clip. And just listening to her, I think there's a lot of room. And I think they, they may be further down the path than the, the press wants us to know. Where is the room for a deal? Well, the room for a deal is that there's got to be some give and take. It's I worked in the private sector my entire career before coming to Congress. In fact, I was a journalist for 20, almost almost 20 years, almost gates. And- Why don't we know her if she was a journalist for 20 years? This is bugging me. Well, I'll look up. Look it and up. Um, then worked there's in healthcare for another people. 10 years. But as you know, uh, when you're not on camera, when you're working with your producers and your photographers and all of that, you know, you got to have a little give and take. And, and if we are unwilling to do that, um, we will not improve the way this place, I'm standing in the U.S. Capitol right now, we will not improve the way Congress functions. And, you know, if it were up to me, I would go into a room, I'd lock the door and say, we're not going to leave until we open up the government again. It is not that hard. Um, I, and I think one other point worth making, the, the wall that President Trump has talked about now for many years, because this was a, a defining theme when he was a candidate, um, it is nothing more than a symbol, if you look at it from this perspective. Um, if we have a partial wall, um, if we have fencing, if we have technology used to keep our border safe, all of that is fine, but it has just become this symbol um, that the president is not having any give or take when it comes to this $5 billion. So, so you said there needs to be give and take, and then you said that you are supportive or at least open to the idea of a partial wall fencing technology. Is that the give here? Are you willing to give some additional funding beyond the $1.3 billion for a partial wall fencing? Now, I hadn't even heard this $1.3 billion number yet. Did that's you- Schumer's number. He said that's what he'd be willing to give for the wall? Or fencing? No, no, none of it was for the wall. It was for border security. Fencing or technology. Well, keep in mind, I'm not sitting at that table doing the negotiating. I mean, I'm running the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. It means I have a seat at the leadership table. But you have a vote in Congress, and you are a member of Democratic leadership, and people are, you know, you got four votes for speaker, and I don't mean to diminish that. People listen here. Hey, what is this four votes for speaker? Fifteen members of the House refused to vote for Nancy Pelosi, and ah, the votes okay. just got scattered around. I got it. Thank so you. Are you saying that that is where you believe Democrats should give? 
I believe that when we are looking at many issues, whether it pertains to rebuilding our country and passing what I hope will end up being a trillion dollar infrastructure package to rebuild our roads or bridges, uh, roads and bridges and water. How about that? What if we fold it into the infrastructure bill? Well, there's sure a lot of wiggle room with a trillion dollar budget. <laughs> well, she's talking to why does she bring that up in relationship to this? Ways in, in rural broadband or whether it has to do with lowering the cost of health care, including the exorbitant prices of prescription drugs, whatever it is. What I'm saying is we can have a starting point uh, that we go in there and we say this is ideally what we would like to see happen. But in the end, we might have to give or take a little bit. Um, uh-huh. It's just the way the world works. It's way, the way our families work. I'm a mother of. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think there's room there, and she's signaling this. Yeah, maybe. I'm not saying she's not. Uh, she's not she, but it's Pelosi's the one who really calls the shots. She worked at the Quad Cities Times as the night shift police reporter. <laughs> wow, that's a gig. <laughs> and she actually got a master's in journalism from University of Illinois to get the gig. Yeah. Well, that in those days, I don't know how old she is, but in the olden days, you'd get you'd come out of uh, She's 50, college. Fifty-seven. Yeah, you come out of college, and you you'd, and you if you had any journalism chops, whether you were the editor of the school paper or you were taking <laughs> journalism courses, you'd get offered these sorts of gigs around the country yeah. when they had real newspapers, and it was always the starting off was always a, a, some cop beat. Uh, you yeah. work with the police department, <clears throat> and that's a, actually kind of. In, made the uh, the reporters a little more street savvy because they actually were out there. Yeah, they, you know? they, they get getting some real uh, information. Yeah. Yeah. Those days are over. Oh, yeah. All righty. I think we're done with the wall. I just thought it was interesting that, uh, you know, how, how it just seems like something, something's going on. There's, uh, there's, I think we will get to something. Something better be going on. Uh, well, it has to, yeah. Well, they talk about this a little bit on democracy now. Let me let me give you an example. Here is a Amy Goodman is going to talk about. They're going to talk very detailed information about the wall and some of the things that went on uh, that are going on in the various administrations. Let's play this. This is Amy regarding shutdown. As the government shutdown moves into its fourteenth day, with eight hundred thousand federal workers either being forced to work without pay or on furlough, and they won't be paid. We go now to Capitol Hill, where we're joined by Democrats. What do you mean, not true? They give everybody back pay for being put on furlough. That's why a lot of them like going on furlough. Why why is she lying to us? I'm wondering myself, because I think she knows the the reality of it. There must be somebody that's that's not going to get paid. I'm not sure what the what the point of that comment was. But and onward. they won't be paid. We go now to Capitol Hill, where we're joined by Democratic Congress member Judy Chu of California. She's the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Um, Congress member Chu is also a member of the Committee on Ways and Means, along with Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. She's introduced the Shutdown Child Prison Camps Act. Her yeah, recent on, piece. The I, I want you to get your pencil because there's going to be so many details. I, about her, this is her. already interesting. <laughs> the title of this act. Yeah. yeah well, the, but you're, now you're going to hear all the really important stuff. So really start writing down notes. Star Go. News is headlined, Shut Down Trump's Child Prison Camp. Congress member <laughs> Judy Chu, welcome to the... Demo- <laughs> Shut Down Trump's Child Prison Camp? Is that seriously what I just heard? Yeah. Hold on. I got to back it up for the title of that act. Peace for the Pasadena Star News is headlined Shut Down Trump's Child Prison Camp. Uh, Congress member Judy Chu, welcome to Democracy Now. Congratulations you. on your swearing in yesterday, along with the most diverse uh, Congress in U.S. history. Your thoughts being in that room and the comparison of the diversity in color, religion, ethnicity, um, uh, sexual identity on the part of the Democrats versus the Republicans. Ooh. 
Oh, it was just so incredibly exciting to be there <laughs> with uh, the now majority in Congress. Uh, you could see the stark difference just when you entered the room as the proceedings started. And that is on the left side of the room where the Democrats sit, there was tremendous diversity. Uh, we have a record number of women in Congress. Now there are over 100 women in Congress, but most of them are on the Democratic side. But there there is also tremendous diversity. We have the greatest number of Latinos, African Americans, and let me also say, we have the greatest number of Asian Pacific Islanders elected to Congress now. Uh, we have gone from 18 to now 20 Asian Pacific Islander members of Congress. But it is so exciting that we have now the first two Native American women in Congress and the first two Muslim American women in Congress. All right. United Colors of Benetton. It's beautiful. Hey, hey. Well, where's this information? What are they talking about? Just sitting there patting herself on the back? Yeah. Oh, we got all these women. And I look over the aisle, and there's a bunch of more women. And look at all these, these people we elected. It's not talking about qualifications or whether any of them are any good. They haven't even been in office for 10 minutes. But they're, they're just all backhand. Hey, wow, backslapping. This is great. Well, this if, is useless. No, if you look at how the Democratic Party runs and what issues they run on, it's diversity. And they said, we're going to get make it more diverse, and they did. They didn't say they were going to get anyone right for the job, and they may very well be. I don't know. But they said they were going for diversity. They delivered on their promise. Let's go with part two. Uh, the first day was to be able to change the rules so that we have greater transparency in Congress. And it was also to pass bills that would end the government shutdown. On the rules issue, yes, un unfortunately, since the last few Congresses, since Republicans took over, we have had a lack of transparency. So our whole goal was to change it so that, for instance, we could have a bill 72 hours before it's voted upon so we can actually read it and contemplate oh oh yeah we'll hold you to that one don't worry <laughs> Wait a second what this woman wasn't this obama's promise when he first became president oh and it's going to be everything's going to be on c-span and you're going to yep. be able to read the yep. bills and all the rest of it yeah that that didn't work either and wasn't nancy pelosi the one that says we got to pass this bill so <laughs> you can read it to see what it says yes yes that's correct that's These why I'm all laughing. Democrats, I don't get it. That's why I'm, I'm laughing. I'm not understanding what she's telling you. In other words, is she just full of crap like the rest of them with, with this nonsense? No, no. They they put out a bill 72 hours in advance before they uh, even bring it to the floor. And uh, I, in fact, I'll read from it in a minute. So they did that. They're working on it. They're getting better. <laughs> so on. that we can have uh, an end to these conflict of interest. So, for instance, members of Congress cannot be on corporate boards. And also so that we can have greater diversity uh, amongst our members. Diversity. Uh, no, no. Diversity. Not diversity. Diversity. Gotta now, I want to mention something here. Of right. course, that, that, that board thing. They're not talking about the real conflict of interest stuff, which is the fact that Congress. Stock trades can do stock trades based on what the legislation is going to be in advance legally is, and they have to legally. report it it's only but it's available only in the basement of the library of congress it's not kidding not kidding no, no copies no copies can be made and, and leave the no. premises no electronic online. equipment you have to bring pencil yeah. or a great memory of greater diverse so, wait wait so they <laughs> they make it they let, let that slide but they they talk about this board member thing knowing full well that none of these diversity folk or anybody on the, <laughs> are, are, on, are the on any boards are on any boards except maybe some public you know uh some soros boards which don't count they're talking about corporate boards of, of money-making companies the soros that board only applies to one half of congress so they can still be on this on a board of a uh, big NGO. Well, you, I'm pretty sure that's true. I'm not. I'll look into that. That's, that's interesting. Side. That's interesting. I'll look if, that's into a, that. if that can be shown, then you can see that this is just a bigoted uh, anti-business kind of thing. Let's hear the Let's word hear, diversity. By the way, I don't again. think these Congress guys should be on boards of corporations. Of course not. But if you're going to start limiting things, you better limit it evenly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Get some diversity. We can have greater diversity. <laughs> <laughs> I nailed it. Uh, amongst our members, uh, allowing religious headgear on the headgear. floor. So those were our rules. <laughs> I've 
I've never <laughs> religious headgear always reminds me of the braces I had with the headgear. I had I hated those things. Had to had to wear them to school. Had to do three notches on the right, two notches on the left. That's headgear on the floor. So those were our rules packages, but the most important thing was that we do not continue the suffering of these federal workers, <laughs> these 800,000 federal workers who either will not be paid or will be paid later and do not have a paycheck now. You want to hear the a bit from the bill that they brought out before they bring it to the floor, the 72-hour bill? Yeah. It's from Sarbanes, put it in, you know, Sarbanes from Sarbanes Act uh, Oxley. Sarbanes Oxley, one of the worst laws in effect ever. So he put out the For the People Act of 2019. Uh, producer Todd caught this and pulled out a couple of things. Uh, this is to, uh, you know, more transparency, rectify the elections, get our elect- electoral system in order. And a couple of points, uh, page 39. Uh, the voting age shall be lowered to 16. Makes sense. Uh, any citizen will be able to request a My Voice voucher worth $25. So this is a voucher you get to even out uh, money in politics, and you can spend that 25 It's federal money. You can spend that $25 uh, on any party or individual you want. Colleges can automatically register students to vote but are not required to ask if they are U.S. citizens, according to the bill. Uh, There's a number of triggers for automatic voter registration. Non-citizens who are registered to vote cannot be charged with a crime unless they knew they were violating the crime. So it was a get-out-of-jail-free card there. Um, Within six months of an election, people cannot use the cross-state registration database to find people who are registered to vote in more than one state. (laughs) What? (laughs) I know. (laughs) Because that's voter suppression. That's a Republican tactic, you see, to find corruption is 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 right wing craziness. Oh my God, that's a that's unbelievable. Voting rights will be restored to convicted criminals as long as they are not in jail on election day. And all states must allow early voting, and polling locations must be moved within walking distance of bus stops. Now let's back up. This is in that bill that's supposed to... Uh, yeah, the For the People get, Act. For, for the People Act. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty good, right? Yeah, it's a scam as usual. Yeah. Oh. Slipping one by. But... Did, oh, I, what, so what does the media say about this? They must have read this over and said <laughs> this. Notice these, these anomalies. Uh, yeah, I have a clip right here. If you know what I mean. No, of course they don't say anything about that. Come on. You know the answers. It's just it's just shameless. <laughs> yeah. and well, th- thanks, thanks, to our, thanks to our producer for yeah, digging that Todd up. That's what we that. do on this show. Yeah, and put the, uh, I put the whole PDF in the show notes, nashownotes.com. You can go find it there. But it's pretty... Oh, huh. by the way, from the future time, for if we can just deviate, or do you have more on... Uh, uh, on, well, let's stop. on the let's diversity? Not. Diversity? Diver- yeah, do you have any good diversity? Or on the 2020? No, go on. Let me see if I have any on 2020. Hold on, before we do anything. Uh, yes. I have... Um, <clears throat> so who, who do we still have running? The three Bs. Beto, Biden, and Bingo. Who's the third? B. Beto, Biden. Uh, 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 b- uh, Bernie. Bernie. We have Kamala Harris. And I think that CNN has really decided to cut Biden out of the three Bs. And, is, and they brought in Sally Cohn, everybody's favorite, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to take him down and let everyone know that, you know, Sally Cohn, besides being a journalist, I think she's good, although incredibly biased. Um, you know, I think she has ties to the Democrats that are deeper than the surface may show. I always think she has inside info. So here's... Uh, Sally Cohn. Let's turn the page, and I know it's so early, but Senator Dianne Feinstein says she would back Joe Biden if he ran in 2020. Have you guys heard this? And not only is it interesting, Sally, to you that, that she'd say something like this so early, but also just keeping in mind, Senator Kamala Harris is her fellow California senator. What do you think? 
Uh, I mean, good honor, but uh, uh, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. Look, uh, the, the... When someone says, I want to respectfully disagree, what do they say that? Oh, is, well, that's a good question to analyze because... People say it a lot. Listen, I, I dis respectfully, I disagree. I think it's it's haughty. Uh, it's um, I think it has bad connotations. I think it means you you think the person's a full jerk of shit. And yeah, you don't, want to... <laughs> I think you don't want to say it. Like, hey, you're so stupid. You're so wrong. But I'm going to tell you how it is. I think you're right. That's kind of that's kind of what it means. Uh, I mean, <laughs> good honor, but uh, uh, I'm going to have good. to. There's another one. Good on her. Good on, on her. her. I what hear... does that even mean? You know, I'm hearing it, having. Having grown up in Europe, growing up with the Germanic languages, I'm hearing sent and sentence structure certainly between Dutch or German and English. Everything is reversed. So instead of saying "What do you say?", you literally say "What say you?" And I'm hearing this coming up now. "What say you?" In some, you know, in certain circumstances, people will use this and to say "Good on you." It's good for you. You know, it, it's like a Germanic thing that's coming in. It's very odd to me where I hear these sentence structures that are different from the traditional English usage. Good on you. Good on her. Good on her. If you don't say it with the right intonation, it sounds stupid. Like, oh, well, good on her. Yeah, that it's sounds good. nasty. Yeah. It doesn't sound right. No. Uh, I mean, good on her, but uh, uh, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. Look. <laughs> I think it's the prelude to F you. <laughs> Uh, the, the, Joe Biden has name recognition, people like him, and in fairness, he's the most sort of populist seeming of a long legacy of centrist corporate Democrats, right? He talked tough, he's from Scranton, he talks about that all the time, and so he sort of seemed, uh, like the most popular, bearing in mind he's from the great banking state of Delaware, yeah. but, but he, he kind of, <laughs> he earned that reputation. But in fairness, the country, look, the country said that never twice. really should have had yep. corporate centrist Democrats. But certainly in this moment, that is so tone deaf and out of step, not only with what the country needs, but with the, what the American people across the aisle want. <laughs> and, and it turns out we are a fundamentally more progressive, uh, inclusive populist country uh, that wants things like higher taxes on the rich uh, and <laughs> solutions what? to climate change and corporations and big business to be held accountable. And we need Democratic candidates who I don't know, actually side with the majority of Americans, not to mention the majority of Democrats, as opposed to siding with big business and Wall Street. Just, uh, <laughs> Uncle Joe just got shoved into Wall Street. Way, to, way to go, Sal. She, uh, hey, look, at, you can sit next to <laughs> Hillary. She's there already. She, um, she runs a think tank that she founded, Sally. She's only sometimes a commentator. Well, she's definitely that. A, a, a stooge for the Democrats. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's, she's totally certain locked Democrats. In. Now, she mentioned the higher taxes, and I'm going to bring it right back to what I said earlier. <laughs> AOC, who I, and I'm, I'm surprised. I have the AOC clip. Yeah, I have it too. Oh, okay. Let me see. How long is your clip? <sighs> Yours is, oh, you have 142. We're going with your clip. You're talking about zero carbon emissions, no use of fossil fuels within 12 years? That is the goal. It's ambitious. And How is that possible? You're talking about everybody having to drive an electric car? It's going to require a lot of rapid change that we don't even conceive as possible right now. <laughs> what is the problem with trying to push our technological capacities to the furthest extent possible. This would require the raising taxes. There's an element where, yeah, there, people are going to have to start paying their fair share in taxes. Do you have a specific on the tax rate? You know, you look at our tax rates back in the 60s, and when you have a progressive tax rate system, your tax rate, you know, let's say from zero to $75,000 may be 10% or 15%, etc. cetera. But once you get to like the tippy tops <laughs> uh, on your 10 millionth dollar, uh, sometimes you see tax rates as high as 60 or 70%. That doesn't mean all $10 million are taxed at an extremely high rate, but it means that as you climb up this ladder, you should be contributing more. What you are talking about, just big picture, is a radical agenda compared to the way politics is done right now. 
Well, I think that it only has ever been radicals that have changed this country. Abraham Lincoln made the radical decision to sign the the Emancipation Proclamation. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made the radical decision to embark on establishing programs like Social Security. That is radical. Do you call yourself a radical? Yeah, you know, if that's what radical means, call me a radical. (laughs) I really like this girl. She is going places. I know you think she's stupid. Gets to me. I don't like her in the least. I think she's. I do think she's stupid, and she's an idealist and uh, a goofball. I think she's something of a goofball. I just do not see what you. What you? I know what you're thinking. Did he shoot six shots or only five? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's a different different script. <laughs> um, but, no, I'm going on record as pro AOC. I think she could do things that I like. She, listen, yeah. here's I have some things to say about this. First of all, what happened to the actual Green New Deal? Black on white, her own paper says we're going to print the money. <clears throat> which we're going to print the money for this Green New Deal, which we only have 12 years to do, really only 10 before we die. Children know it that you ask any child uh, particularly if they just got into college, what's happening with, with climate change, we're going to die. So let's just bear that in mind. Children believe this. She believes this, I think. I think so. She said it was going to be done by printing up money just the way we did the bailout in 2008. So she's changed. This is the question Pooper should have asked. Instead, she brings up a prog- the progressive tax system, which we've had all my life. And yes, it's even today, if you make X amount, you pay only so much over the first $25,000, 50000 I don't know exactly what the brackets are. And then you get into the tippy top, as she calls it. Tippy top. Which is, Scott Adams would say persuasive. Gets into the tippy top, and that's where you may wind up paying more. And I went back and I looked throughout the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, up until 1981, the tippy top tax rate in the United States was over 70%. So yeah, but it's not crazy. But go back into that era, and the tippy-top top tax rate at 71% did exist. But there were a million ways to lower your tax liability through all kinds of R&D deals and the, the certain kinds of investments and write-offs this way and write-offs that way. And very few people that made that kind of money, that made the $10 million plus a year, ever paid those tax rates because they had been p- putting the money here and putting the money there. These were called the loopholes that were closed. And once they start closing the loopholes and they had to start lowering the tax rates because it was a it was a one to one ratio. So this is really misconstrued. This is a, a specious uh, commentary that she's making. It's bullshit. Um, that may be true. Um, I, the only thing I'm saying is it's not crazy to have that uh, upper tax rate in a progressive system, and people shouldn't immediately be, oh, uh, uh, uh. however, even more importantly, if that's all it would take to get the Green New Deal going, to save our lives, I expect every person who is a Democratic voter or a Democratic operative or politician to agree to this idea. To save the world. I bet we won't, but it's not. It's, I'd like you to see really her push it think through. that people like Nancy Pelosi and the real movers and shakers in the party buy into any of the we're all going to die nonsense? No, but, no, that, of course but, but that's how I can make my point. If they don't buy into it, if they don't say, hey, you know, okay, make it 60%. Make it an even 50 Whatever you're going to do, that's the way we typically do things with raising money. If it truly is the most important thing in the world, because we're all going to die, then they should all be pushing for it. They won't because it's not true. We're not going to die. My point is about the science of climate change and the hood that's been pulled over everybody's eyes. So Not the, everybody. No, but the people who are advocating for this. The suckers. The people who are advocating for the we're all going to die, climate change, don't deny, science is in. They should be all in on at least this idea. I agree, and I think a lot of them are. We'll see. I, I bet not a single one of them supports this idea. Not a single one. 
A single one of who? The Congress members? Yes. The Democrats who say we're going to die from climate change. Them, yes. Oh, well, maybe. By the way, this I was... I think there's more than a single. I think there's a few. This was all predicted. Mostly the newbies that just came in. Did you see the uh, the article that now, you know, the orbit of the the Earth is changing slightly and therefore... You're going to spin out <laughs> And then, no, therefore, climate change, you know, it, it may end by itself or not. Oh, no, they're looking for the out. They're looking for their exit strategy for the bullshit. Listen the to bull this. Crap. So this this actually appeared in 1961, uh, November 17th, in an episode of The Twilight Zone. The word that Mrs. Bronson is unable to put into the hot, still, sodden air is doomed. Because the people you've just seen have been handed a death sentence. One month ago, the Earth suddenly changed its elliptical orbit and in doing so began to follow a path which gradually, moment by moment, day by day, took it closer to the sun. And all of man's little devices to stir up the air are no, no longer luxuries. They happen to be pitiful and panicky keys to survival. The time is five minutes to twelve, midnight. There is no more darkness. The place is New York City and this is the eve of the end. Because even at midnight, it's high noon, the hottest day in history, and you're about to spend it in the Twilight Zone. Now, that, so that's the setup, but in the show <laughs> itself, this is what happens. Oh, there was a scientist on the radio this morning. He was trying to explain what happened, how the Earth had changed its orbit and was starting to move away from the sun, and that within one, two, or maybe three weeks at the most, there wouldn't be any more sun. We'd all freeze. <laughs> Nothing ever changes. <laughs> Nothing. Same script. You remember that episode. It's pretty funny. You remember it. Well, oh, that's great. <laughs> let's go back to 1988 for the uh, upcoming election. Hold on. 1988. Hello, John. Hello. Yeah, I was having trouble with my segue, obviously. Yes, yes. <laughs> it ran off a hill. Um, <laughs> Gore is running. He's one of the main candidates. Uh this is the the election to, against uh, George H. W. Bush, the first time he after right after Reagan's eight years, and so we have a few things here, uh, including uh, let's just play these two Gore clips from 1980, just pre-election, so just before the election when he was one of the five candidates. Dukakis won this thing; he didn't, but he had a few things to say that he's kind of stuck with. But I see that he's kind of edited down his complaints. Let's start with. <coughs> Uh, Gore Freon. The other five candidates in the race. Uh, and later in the campaign, I'll be doing the same thing on, on domestic well, issues. You give us a clue where the difference are. You've heard these guys, and we all have, for about six months. You know what you believe for the last 10 years. So where do you think the differences are going to be? Is education, social programs? Well, I think there are going to be some differences uh, in, in education, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, this uh, uh, in, in environmental protection. Uh, and in, in a number of other issue areas, I'm the only candidate to talking about the need for a completely new approach to environmental protection, as, as an example. I'm chairman of the largest environmental protection group in the Congress. Uh, I chaired the first hearings ever held on the problem of hazardous chemical waste and pollution of groundwater uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, I was one of the principal uh, authors of the Superfund law. Uh, I've been active in issues from clean air and clean water to protection of the upper atmosphere and the rainforests and ocean pollution, management of public lands. Uh, and the positions I've articulated uh, are, are, I'll give you an example. Did he at any point mention that he invented the Internet? The, he invented the Internet later. Oh. When I uh, <laughs> announced my candidacy, I talked about the threat to the ozone layer, uh, among many, many other issues. And some of the other campaigns uh, said, uh, sort of hooted at that and said, this is uh, uh, really a kind of a, uh, an unusual issue that the voters will not respond to. I find a tremendous response from the voters. I find Americans all over this country actively concerned about the impact of our civilization on the global environment. Uh, and the next president must not only understand that impact, but must be prepared to offer strong, innovative leadership nationally and internationally to stop that damage. The recent treaty, incidentally, uh, on uh, the ozone depletion, 
uh, accomplishes a 35% reduction in the, in, in the uh, production of these chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Oh, yeah. And yet the evidence shows that there must be an 85% reduction just to stabilize the amount of damage being done. Uh, in other words, under this treaty, the damage will not only continue, it will accelerate fairly dramatically throughout the balance of this century. That's unacceptable. Now, there may be some market developments that help us deal with the problem, and the treaty may accelerate those market trends. Well, this was his whole thesis for, 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 the for running for anything. It's to scare the crap out of the public, have these assertions like like by the year 2000, apparently, according to him, there were, the hole was going to get bigger when it got smaller and all this sort of thing. But the next one, which is the second clip, has an assertion with an actual time and date – well, date that it should be noted. <laughs> let me, let me like, guess. <laughs> okay, yeah, because it's it's he says it, and I do the calculation, and I it didn't happen. But but there are many other challenges. Climate change is an issue that again wow. is 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 out in front of the domestic consensus on what the agenda of the next president ought to be. But the next president needs to provide leadership there as well. Destruction of the rainforest. We're losing rainforests in the world today at, at the rate of uh, one Tennessee's worth every year, an amount of uh, land equivalent <laughs> to the size of the state of Tennessee every single year. By the year 2010, it'll all be gone. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's gone. Gone. It's gone. Is it gone? Did you check? It's not, yeah, I did check. Is it gone? It's not gone. Oh, my. It looks as if it's not even <laughs> close to being gone. Just the, You can look up, you know, uh, rainforest and the Wikipedia, and you can see them all. They're still there. It's just not but gone. That, but according to him, it's not they're going to be gone by 2010. <laughs> all right, let's come back. Oof. It's better back here. Um, a couple of things we've talked about that are Rain. coming that are coming true. Um, oh. Yes, that are panning out. A while back, we identified that the excessive use of cuss words amongst leftists, liberals, Democrats was increasing. And this increase signaled something to me. It signaled uh, a, a severe frustration. And I said, it's only going to get worse. You're hearing it on podcasts everywhere. People who would never use any kind of profanity uh, are using the F word excessively. Now, I have Tourette, so you got to give me a little slack. You actually have used some... You use the S word today. You rarely even do that. Not I saying that was the BS word. I'm not even saying that you're a leftist, but it came. It came true. I mean, it is. They are. This is a break in the psychology, in the psyche of uh, people who typically are left, but who hate Trump. People love you, and you win. Woo! And when your son looks at you and says, "Mama, look, you won." Bullies don't win. And no. I said, baby, they don't. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the motherfucker. And listen to the cheering. Yeah, the cheering. Woo! You said MF! Woo! Woohoo! This, uh... It's just getting worse. This was an example, but I think a lot of it has to do with education, too. Uh, people that are uh, typical truck drivers, people with really no... Uh, this no, woman's not a have truck a driver. Vocabulary that's big enough to handle uh, just not using F. But this, or what, but this uh, woman's not a truck driver. And by the way, truck drivers aren't stupid. They have vocabulary. No, but they don't. They, a lot of truck drivers get into this. A milieu. I'm sorry. Okay, milieu, milieu is all right. That's more fair. Yes. The milieu of truck of certain working classes uh, is involves a lot of cussing. The uh, this woman, to me, is uh, this is a, a, an important especially the way it was handled, this is an important situation because this can't be tolerated by Nancy Pelosi. Exactly. She And if she can't control these new people that are coming in, and she's going to have to take them one by one, she's going to have a mess on her hands. I think, they I think all it's too think late. That they're, sorry? <laughs> I, think, I think it's already done. They brought in all the diversity, and that's the mess. Yeah, diversity is the mess. Yeah. Whether Nancy can organize it at her age not to be an ageist and already insulted our truck drivers <laughs> um 
I don't think she can do it. I think the whole Democrat Party is going to fall apart. It's going to be it's going to be an embarrassment as the, those sorts of things that that woman did. She's the new she's a Muslim, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, from Michigan. I think she's the Michigan woman. She, that is going to really turn off the American public insofar as Democrats are concerned. I agree. Uh, and I, You're right. <clears throat> I think it is signaling something that's a much bigger problem. <clears throat> totally agree. I have a clip. Uh, oh, here it is. This is Diversity uh, and Pelosi Regains Gavel. This is from Democracy Now! It discusses a little bit of this. Incoming members of the 116th Congress made history Thursday as the most diverse group of lawmakers ever sworn in. Over 100 women now serve in the House, along with the most LGBTQ black and Latino members in history. Meanwhile, Democratic Congress member Nancy Pelosi of California was officially elected Speaker of the House again, regaining the gavel she lost after the 2010 midterm elections brought eight years of Republican control to the House. Our nation is at a historic moment. Two months ago, the American people spoke and demanded a new dawn. They called sure. upon the beauty of our Constitution, our system of checks and balances that protects our democracy, remembering that the legislative branch is Article One, the first branch of government co-equal to the presidency and to the judiciary. Fifteen Democrats, including some freshman lawmakers, defected against Pelosi's speakership, either voting for an alternative candidate or simply voting present. As a first order of business, House Speaker Pelosi and House Democratic leaders sought to end the partial government shutdown, passing a package of spending bills that would reopen the federal government without meeting Trump's demand for $5 billion for expanding the wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. So Pelosi's got – she has some defectors, which is she, – she'll punish those 15. But she's also going to punish the few that threatened to uh, not vote for her but did. They voted for her anyway, but they're, they're all marked. They're all be on the, you know, the Commerce Committee for Sewage Treatment. They're marked. And all these were some of the worst, you know, farm animals. Uh, <laughs> She was uh, she was also sl- kind of sh- sloshing her words a bit. Like a, she's, a, I think she's got denture. Sounds I like think denture. She does. Hey, listen to I this. Think she- listen to this. Thank you for your courage. Yay! <laughs> courage, courage. She's got some serious. Yeah, she's got to have a ref- some refitting. Refitting, done. yes, retooling, maybe. I got a dub flub on you. Listen to. Tell me if you can spot the aim. The Amy. Hey, this is actually a double flub. Okay. See if you can spot both of them. This is about the Google story where, you know, Google apparently is dodging taxes. Big shocker. Uh, uh, but listen, the see if you can find the two double flubs, and they're not necessarily mispronouncing things. It's what she says. Newly revealed tax filings show Google shifted $23 billion to accounts in Bermuda in 2017 as part of a complex tax avoidance scheme that saved the tech giant billions of dollars in revenue. The scheme involved funneling money through Google Ireland Holdings and a Dutch shell company based in Bermuda, where corporations pay no income tax. The scheme, known as the Double Irish Dutch Sandwich, is legal, although Ireland's government has said it will close a loophole allowing the arrangement in 2020. Okay, first of all, it's a double Dutch. It's never a double Irish. That's just <laughs> stupidity. And I think she also said it would save the millions in revenue, which is not true. Yes, that yeah. was mistake number one. Yeah, it's not true. Uh, it's it's just going to save billions in taxes. taxes. Yes, but not, not in revenues. revenues. Revenues are whatever. Revenues are revenues. It doesn't save you any and revenues. The Dutch so just that wrong. The Dutch just called. They want their their other part back. Don't Play the clip again because there's a second one in there and I forget. I oh, really? Besides it. that, there's one? Oh. Newly revealed tax filings show Google shifted $23 billion to accounts in Bermuda in 2017 as part of a complex tax avoidance scheme that saved the tech giant billions of dollars in revenue. The scheme involved funneling money through Google Ireland Holdings and a Dutch shell company based in Bermuda, where corporations pay no income tax. The scheme, known as the Double Irish Dutch Sandwich, is legal although Ireland's government has said it will close a loophole allowing the arrangement in 2020. Allowing the arrangement. Yeah, that it came out, It you came know, out weird. No, it just came out weird. I may have weird. clipped out the second one. Well, I, I, gaps, I, no, okay, anyway. I have, something much, I have something much more important. 
from the future we are. Yeah, of course. Wherever Ebola shows up, we always expect the U.S. military to follow. Now, you wouldn't know it from the American news, or if you, dare I say, even any news in the Western uh, in the Western world. No, but if we go to Africa today... The United States has deployed soldiers to Gabon in anticipation of possible violent demonstrations in the Democratic Republic of Congo after its presidential election. U.S. President Donald Trump told Congress on Friday the first batch of about 80 military personnel arrived in Gabon on Wednesday. Their mission will be to protect U.S. citizens and diplomatic facilities should violence break out in DRC's capital, Kinshasa. Trump said additional forces may be deployed to Gabon if necessary. And notice no mention of Ebola. It's completely off the map. We don't care. We got what we needed. Hey, we get them in one way or the other. Troops in the DRC. Just a matter of time. How'd you get that? That was a good clip. Oh, it, well, Reuters actually reported on it. They did do a uh, a, uh, a news release about the U.S. troops being deployed, uh, but it was it was not mentioned. I need. I was looking for a clip, and this is all I could find. I found a million clips with some shit music and titles. You know, those. Oh uh, yeah, those are the worst. Algo assembled pieces of crap. And you're like, oh, I got a clip. No, I don't. Um, so yeah, and then I I just went back to the well. Africa I today. I think that the, the fact that the mainstream news media, including the CNN and MSNBCs of the world, spent all this time about this briefing, the definition of briefing, <laughs> instead of something and like they, this. They let stories like this just slide. Well, who cares? That's why we're going to be great this year. You think it's going to get worse? Oh, the the the, the mainstream news, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, all three of them are going to do 2020 all day, all night long. It will be nothing else. It's decided that they're doing it. It's like the MH17. It's, they're just going to go. It's only, you know, it's only uh, two years. They don't care. You and might be right. I hate to see it because it's, it's going to be seems, incredibly it boring. Gonna, the public doesn't care about 2020. They won't care about 2020 <laughs> until 2020. What you're seeing is a total withdrawal. You're seeing a withdrawal. People are just not interested anymore. They're turning off the television. It's just, it's only going to go downhill. I, I, it's easy to predict this one. Easy. So, you know, now for us, we're just going to deconstruct other news sources. You know, still, if you go to RT or Sky News, you get different things. And at least you can get something from a different country. That seems to be completely Actually, impossible. Actually, I've been looking at CBC this week. We need to take a break, though, before we go into another, uh, another segment. Okay. But we'll be doing CBC News after I thank you for your courage and say in the morning to you, John C., the man who put the C in cussing, Dvorak. Uh, in the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry. Also in the morning to all the boots on the ground, the feet, the air, the subs, and all the dames and the knights out there. In the morning to the troll room. You can find them and join their legions of trolls at noagendastream.com. And it's good to see everybody there. Aloha. Nice to see you've got your troll polls. Also in the morning, Darren O'Neill, he brought us the artwork, the album artwork for episode 1100. This was the Flash Meetup, which we need to hear about. And uh, he had a, just a nice piece, a, a, uh, what was it, a tachometer or a speedometer. It had 33 as the only indicator and 1100 on what would maybe be the odometer. It was just a nice piece, particularly because it was our 1,100th episode, and we thank Darren and everyone who submitted artwork and continue to do as a part of our value for value system, where you give back the value that uh, you get out of it. And for a lot of people, they put in their artistry, and we appreciate what they do. No agenda art generator dot com. Thank you again, Darren O'Neill. We have a funny situation here that I not I haven't straightened it out. Uh oh. But uh, there's a, there's a Sir Scott and there's a Sir Richard. Okay. And and I don't believe that this is this. It may or may not be the same person, but uh, neither one of them wants to be mentioned except their name, Sir Scott or Sir Richard. At least it says Sir Richard on the note. Um, and the, both of the numbers were uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, I don't see Sir Scott on the list. Well, Sir Scott's the one I've been going back and forth with because of this. This. <laughs> okay, so I've got. You sound troubled. Long, what? You sound troubled. I am troubled because I have not been able to figure out why. Let me go get the note. Hold on a second. 
Okay. Uh, play a little uh, uh, rambling uh, uh, squirrel mail music. <laughs> okay. Rambling squirrel mail music. I don't know how to do that, man. Uh, I need to make that easier to find. Oh. Yeah. Here we go. Will he find it? He's looking for the donation note. Running over to the printer. I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, you're back already? You didn't give me, I gotta do the whole song. It took you longer to get it than it took me to get this note. <laughs> okay. So this donation is to say thank you for the fine product you deliver twice a week for myself, a sim- simple jobs karma, the original Pelosi, no Trump, Sir Richard. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yet, Scott, Scott, Sir Scott, um, had sent in one, two, three, four, five, six. And it was it's it, it can only match the same exact check, but I really not, have no it, idea what you're same, talking wait, wait, about. Wait, wait. Here's the real problem. I'm gonna have to fuck, do some more emailing. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. Okay, now. <laughs> Thank you. What Thank is you. happening? I get it now. Sir Scott, who is a sir. Uh, wanted to be called Sir Richard initially, but then when we went back and forth with the email, because this check was a week late. Oh, okay. Uh, he forgot about that part because he wanted to be super anonymous. So he became, now he's two guys. <laughs> That's pretty right. anonymous. Yeah, okay. Okay, I got it. Because it's the same, I'm saying that it's the same guy, Scott and Richard, because they're both in Louisville, Kentucky. You weren't, and they gave the- you weren't listening to, you weren't listening to Rihanna again, were you? No, I should have been. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Jeez, this show is a botch for me. <laughs> but anyway, let's go on. And then we want to thank uh, Sir Scott Richard for uh, his um, – Scott Richard. It's a good name. It's so a show business name. And he just wanted a Jobs uh, – uh, Nancy uh, Jobs? Yeah, Nancy Jobs. Oh, yeah. Right. Jobs, Jobs, <laughs> Jobs, and Jobs. Let's vote for Jobs. You yeah! thought – Karma. Okay, well, at least we figured it out. Yeah, sure. All right, so we onward. That's it. That's our executive producer. Oh. And luckily he came in at all. Well, but uh, it's Robert, nice. We appreciate that, Sir Scott Richard thing and such. Sir Richard Scott. And Sir such. Richard Scott. What a great name. Sir Richard Scott and such. And such. Yeah, that's his new name, Sir Richard Scott his and such. Name. Yes. Uh, Robert Warner in Chicago, 23535. Uh, I look for a note. No Nothing. note. I don't, I don't have one either. Jim Watts, 233.33. This is a test of the no agenda karma system. Uh, World Cup luge racing karma needed for human resource number. One. Okay, normally we do not do sports karma related karmas, but since it's a relative, it's a, it's a human resource number one. Yes. We can give it a shot. So, so Jim's human resource number one is a World Cup luge racer. Yeah. Top that, uh, Adam I Carolla. Know, I can't top it. <laughs> I mean, any other podcast is what I mean. He who says, el- sure. Oh, yeah. Well, that's who sure. else has World Cup luge racers participating None. in our program? Zero. No, zero. He says, exactly. I'm not sure if that falls under the jobs banner. Uh, dealer's choice Ooh. karma, please. So I Ooh. Would give him the- Ooh. Do you think we should make that a jobs karma? I think it's, it is a job. It is a job. I think, I think we're going to go for the job karma for human resource yeah. number one. Let's give it a shot. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. Yeah! You thought karma. All right. Well, let us know how that goes, Jim. Very curious. Now, now again, this is not something we encourage. And uh, I think for relatives and it, and looking at it from the jobs perspective, I do think it's it's possible that uh, that this is on the up and up. You do think? I I do think. <laughs> I don't think. You do. I think. don't think it's possible. But I do think <laughs> that is possible. Uh huh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're for, welcome. Thank, You're welcome. For further humiliating me. Oh come on! It's just a Can show. You, uh oh, great. Okay, just, sir uh, Jeffrey. Now this is another note. No note. I got a Jeffrey guy with his with his accounting. 
Um, but it's not this Jeffrey. This is Jeffrey Fields. Fields. Let me look up Fields. I'm not going to do the whole squirrel mail no, thing No, again. you don't have no. You can't find it. I have nothing from Mr. Fields. Mr. Field, W.C. Fields, no. I have nothing from him. No, no. I have Allison Fields, Anthony, Tom. No. No, no I got nothing. Not even close. So we got nothing. But so that's, we got him as an associate executive producer with $200. We'll take yeah, that. So let's combine our, our missing uh, Robert Warner and Jeffrey Fields and give them a joint karma. You got it. You've got karma. And that's pretty much it. Okay. All right. Well, this is our value for value system. And, the, and we make it work in a number of ways. First of all, we know how the, the network cannot be monetized. Ads doesn't work. Ask Laura Ingram how it works having ads if you want to say whatever you want to say. Yeah. yeah. Her radio show, well, I mean, she really got kicked off because of advertiser pressure. Yeah, I think she was on one of the networks that you can't monetize, but she was on one of them. Well, no, that, yeah. is, that is a monetized network because yeah. that's a closed loop. Yeah. Well, you know, it's get kicked off. Yeah, that's exactly uh, it. The internet is, I, is... What I like about this is what I enjoy about... The, I, I kind of enjoy watching these, uh, these, hap- these things happening um, because it's like, oh... Yeah, oh, the good support from your, uh, you know, you, you've you been there, you've been making the network money because they're not putting you up for free and people like your show. Some people, I guess, I don't know. I've always found the show to be not quite as, I like your TV shows better, but she's making money for them. And it's just a little crack, little, there's one little complaint, a couple of advertisers bail out and you th- kick her out, you throw her out in the baby with the bathwater. Sure. You just. Boost, give her kick around on her butt. She's bouncing on her on her butt right out the studios. I mean, what kind of operations are these? Money making operations up for their people. No, of course not. Why would they? They're money making operations. Oh no way! I wouldn't do it either. She'd be gone in a heartbeat if I was running the place. Well, you're of heartless. Course. No, I, that's your job as a corporation. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's a myth. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Okay. All righty then. How many corporations have you run? Well, I've actually run a couple, but they're all like me and, and Mimi. This is yeah, a very I've, small corporation. I've, I've run a public company. You don't care. I didn't like the job very much, I'll be honest, but you don't care. It's, it's just you can't. There are plenty of CEOs of big corporations who do care. <laughs> okay. I know in the information business. In media. In the, in the, John, the, course, you got. Well, you, hold on a second. Let how me can you even say point. this? You got deplatformed from PC Magazine over one article in your 35 year uh, history with them. Yeah, I agree with that. I know yeah. was, there, were, there were douchebags for doing that. Yeah. But, but let me give you an example of how the newspapers used to be run. You start attacking some guy and threatening the newspaper, the newspaper would go after this you. Is not a, this is not a newspaper. This it's, is it's a, an information outlet, and they could go after the advertisers. That's what Limbaugh has been doing. Every time somebody threatens to pull the advertiser from Limbaugh, he, he tells he sends his ditto heads out to make their lives miserable. That's what you do. <laughs> there's a difference between Rush Limbaugh and Laura Ingraham. <laughs> yes, okay, well, there's that. Difference. This is true. But, here, but here's still. what I wanted to point out, besides all that, um, is that we re- we recognize early on the only way to to pull this model off is to open up two things one donation amounts make them people can, can personalize them and also it's the value you determine it's like if if we're worth 5 bucks we're worth 5 bucks fine it's it's perfect it doesn't well, matter so we left that open we didn't we didn't say you have to do this or have to do that get whatever you right, think right. Is, is valuable second thing we do everything ourselves there is no, you cannot have producers that you that you hire and put on a payroll because it just there's not enough money in in the value network. I don't think it is for any system really. And, and I'm always stunned by the podcasts that have maybe three people taking part <sighs> and credits, a, a, a credit roll, <laughs> a guy, a guy on the board, a producer, a booker. I mean, they maybe have six, seven people working there, and it's like that is like uh, five or six too many. So the first, one of the first things we did, is, or early on, is we said, our audience are not listeners. They're not schlubs just sitting around. They know stuff. We figured it out pretty quickly. So we got every three-letter agency, certainly in the, in the United States, was sending us information. Like, oh, we listened to you guys. The CDC, I think, was the first. 
Yeah, like we're always, we're laughing show. about you guys, but you're more right than you're wrong. And here's what we think about X, Y, and Z. So we said these are our real producers, and the production work they do is the value that it's returning the value they get from the show. They don't have to support us financially, so that worked very well. We also, and I've made incessant. This is an OCD thing of mine: is to keep it all contained, whole all production that we can just do it ourselves. And I see these networks. I, did I send? I think I sent you this article. This is the WSDG. This is the outfit that builds studios. They you know, it used to be exclusively recording studios. Do a lot of broadcast studios. Yeah. And they did the the Gimlet Media. Yeah, studio. Yeah. yeah. In twenty thousand square foot Brooklyn facility. Dedicating yeah, there, there's your overhead. Dedicating twenty seven hundred square feet to one studio, and they have they got Dillette systems so they can you know copy edits back and forth between their twelve podcast studios, including a full music product recording studio. These guys are insane. <laughs> Do they? Re- oh, I wish they would just say, "Hey, how did that work out when you guys did it?" Well, it didn't. You can't do this. It doesn't work that way anymore. Oh, my goodness. I'll put that in the show notes. you got to see the facility. It's bigger than my apartment. Yeah, you can move in there. Significantly bigger than my apartment. I'm in a closet. I'm in a closet. It's just, it's well, I want to mention something. You mentioned how the, how, the, how the donation amounts they vary so much because it's, you know people can choose their own. We have to remember that we kind of picked up. It was, it was actually, again, in the early days, yes, it, was producers. it was the producers that could come up with these crazy numbers. Yep. You know, they would have some number. Then we we spend half the show decoding. What does this number mean? And I guess <laughs> that's it right. was the, you know, it's that's the square root of pi. It became pi. a thing. Yeah, it became a thing. If you make it a Fibonacci, I mean, what? Mm-hmm. So, it's important so it, to people, so don't be so stringent. Anyway, what I'm saying is, for those of you who've been with us for 11 years, you've been with us for 11 minutes. Thank you. You clearly understand how it works. And we really appreciate the value you return to us because we can keep doing it this way. And we're not we're not spending it on twenty seven hundred square foot studios in a twenty thousand square foot Brooklyn facility. And that's all VC money. They're not making enough to sustain no, they're that. They're VC. not making. They're just throwing money away. VCs are idiots. I wish. I the, wish this. If, if someone lives in Brooklyn, can you just be a, on the standby? Because when they fold, I want you to be able to go in and put your stickers on the equipment. We could use some of that. We, we wouldn't yeah. mind buying oh, some of that out we of the, always use some, the some bankruptcy. Nice, good used yes. equipment. And in the meantime, you can also consider supporting us for our next show, uh, in which I'll probably have. Isn't the, isn't the Golden Globes tonight? That was. I think it's tonight. Uh, Something's yeah. tonight. Something's tonight. Well, I'll have a yeah, report. Golden Globes are tonight. Yeah, yes. I'm sure we'll have a report. Please support us at Dvorak.org. Slash N-A. So now you know all about the value for value model. Go out there and propagate this information. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. World While on the subject of the Golden Globes, <laughs> yes. I have this, uh, this little clip because everybody's now, uh, you know, they've changed the way these shows are because the women just don't get up to look pretty. They have to make a statement. So they read this. This, this the clip is uh, politicizing the awards power in the form of fashion. Okay. And Generation Z is at the forefront of oh, breaking hold on, the mold. Hold on, hold on. I have two of these clips. Play the play the CBC clip first. Hollywood's award season has arrived. Beginning Sunday with the Golden Globes, the stars will be getting their steps in on the red carpet. And with much of the world watching, these sorts of things are always an opportunity for fashionable drama. Except now, the question you're more likely to hear, perhaps, may not be, who are you wearing, but why are you wearing that? As Zuleka Nethu explains, <laughs> the Hollywood red carpet seems to have become the fabric of a very political message. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. 
First, there were the black dresses at last year's Golden Globes to show solidarity with sexual harassment and assault survivors. Then the orange pins at the Oscars to protest gun violence. And a few months ago at the Emmys, Jennifer Lewis's Nike outfit in support of Colin Kaepernick. Lately, red carpets have been less about fashion statements and more about political ones. This is a new form of currency, is activism. And Carla Welch is at the centre of it. In between celebrity fittings here at her L.A. studio for clients like Sarah Paulson and Elizabeth Moss, the Canadian stylist posts social media messages on immigration, voting and Uh. Indigenous issues. She dressed actor Tracy Ellis Ross in an array of black designers at the American Music Awards and worked behind the scenes to support the Time's Up movement. Welch has become one of the most sought-after stylists among Hollywood's elite, not despite her views, but because of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it starts to make you sick. Yes. So do you, do you remember, remember when the Dixie Chicks and oh, yeah. Michael Moore told George Bush he was an a-hole and the left went... <gasps> That was in yeah. my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. That's well. changed quite a bit. Yeah, now that you're the MF. M- yes, M- MF. Yes. Yeah, the MF. Yay! So, they, no, they've gone out of off the deep end. So let's, let's finish this up. The other part's part two. And Generation Z is at the forefront of breaking the mold. Politically active 18-year-old actress Yara Shahidi wore a skirt covered with the face of African-American activist Angela Davis to a high-profile event in April. Stranger Things star so Millie Bobby brave. Brown wore the names of Parkland shooting victims on the back of her shirt so at the brave. Kids' Choice Awards. The rise in social media has allowed celebrities to be a little bit more open about who they truly are. And I also think that the election Dip of shit. Trump has made a lot of people feel like, look, I'm not willing to just be quiet. Believe in something. Be quiet. Boys also recognize the power of speaking up. 14-year-old Brown credited Calvin Klein for the design of her shirt to her 18 million Instagram followers. And Shahidi's Angela Davis skirt was made by Prada. I think that the days of just being like, oh, I look pretty in a dress, which I love. We love celebrating fashion. We love wearing beautiful clothes. But they're coming a little bit to a close. And I think it's a good thing that there's different ways of using power. Power in the form of fashion. Why do you uh, do this to me? Why do you do this to me? Uh, I do it because I know it makes you as sick as it makes me. Well, you going- I listened to the clip and I said, oh, my God, I'm getting sick. I've got to put this on the show because I Adam deserves to be just this sick. Well, you're going to regret it with what I have for you next. Then Uh-oh. this is we're going to stay with award shows. The Kevin Hart drama. Now, instead of talking about you know elections in the Congo and sending troops there. Which yeah. I think uh, isn't that kind of a thing these days where we have or don't have troops. No, don't report on that. No, no. let's get into Kevin Hart's tweets. And this was this was kind of a, I don't think we even talked about it. It's a little issue. No, we we managed to avoid it. Yeah, we did. But then Ellen invited Kevin Hart on as a uh, to create a bridge between Kevin Hart and the Academy, so he can host the Academy Awards again. Well, let's, let's, let, let me help a little bit by backing this up. Kevin Hart was initially announced by the Academy Awards group to host the show. And then somebody came up with some – he apparently had some – this is kind of the snide, anti-gay uh, tweets from some, I don't know, 10 years ago. Around the so. time of his special where he had similar jokes in the special. Yeah, it was pretty much just jokes on, uh, as tweets. And so somebody brought this up and said, oh, my God. This is terrible. And Hart would, before it even became a scandal, quit. He said, I'm not going to do this show. Yes. He said, I've already apologized for those tweets, and I'm not going to do it again just to be able to host the show. Otherwise, it'll keep coming back. I think he was right about that. Yes. And then Ellen wanted to uh, build the bridge. And I've been learning. Yes. Go ahead. I believe. I do believe. Mm -hmm. I do believe that um, somebody, there's some... They can't get a host for this ABC. show. ABC. It's ABC. Ellen's on ABC. Hello. Yeah. Hello. It's ABC. Yeah. ABC said, you got to patch this up, Ellen. Make it happen. Because we won't have any ratings. Every year this show comes out, the ratings go down. We look like doofuses. We've got to get this guy. He's at least entertaining. Maybe he can pull it together because we've had good luck in the past, you know, with other black guy, with other black hosts yep. and comedian hosts. And this guy's at the top of his game as a comic. 
you got to get him out because we got nobody else to do it. We can't get anyone that we want. So this was a, something of a scam. And um, was it not who, who uh, was it? The Ellen show that had the uh, had the Vegas massacre security guard on. Yeah, which was something of a scam. Something of a scam because she has deals with the she's got slot machines and everything. Was that the Ellen show? I think it was the Ellen show. Yes, it was because there's a, there is a slot machine called the Ellen. Yes. So yeah. so she is all in on the corporate structure and she is doing whatever oh, no, she ABC is a wants for, her to do. For big big business. And and I've learned a lot about Ellen. I watched her her special on uh Netflix and that was quite good and she's got an interesting background. I learned some things I didn't know about her career yeah, she's a san francisco comic and um you know so she's clearly all in with the system and i think she made a big mistake by trying to patch over the uh homophobic nature of kevin hart's past uh, that's how it's categorized i don't think he's a homophobe i think he's just making jokes uh and 10 years ago you could make different jokes uh, I think she's going to, she, and I already see evidence of it. She's being excoriated by the community, which I don't believe exists. But okay, there's supposed to be some LGBTQ, or to be precise, LGBTQQIAAPK community. And this came true just the other night as Don Lemon, the overnight sensation on CNN, schooled Kevin Hart and more. And he did this in a 10-minute soliloquy. 10 minutes no. of valuable. Why did they leave this guy on the 10 air? minutes of valuable overnight airtime. <laughs> so I br- just by cutting out the pauses, which I did this morning, it was four minutes. That's how long his pauses were. And then I cut it down at, almost in half again to be able to share on the show. So I'm saying right off the bat, it is not a true representation of what he said because of all the very... Long pauses. Yeah, but dramatic I, pauses. But I learned a lot about the black community, and I learned a lot about community. I just, I'm just i using Don Lamont's words. The black community and the LGBT community. And it is an eye-opener. Kevin, if anything, this is the time to hear other people out, to understand why they might have been offended. And I don't see any meaningful outreach to the LGBT community. And now you want the conversation to end. But many of us really need to keep the conversation going. It's life or death. And someone like Kevin Hart with one of the... Just so you know, life or death now. We're talking about a comedian and the Oscars. Life or death. Biggest megaphones in the world can be a leader. The ultimate change agent. Uh He can help change homophobia in the black community. Okay. This is where I like. What do you mean homophobia in the black community? You're telling me that that people of a different color are different. This does not sit well with me, Don. Something Kevin's old Twitter jokes addressed, but in the wrong way. So take the tweet where he said that he would um, break a doll a dollhouse over his son's head if he found him playing with it. He said that's gay. By the way, if you look at the, this is so egregiously shitty of Don Lemon to do. He takes a tweet that is a joke with a punchline, and he removes the punchline and says, oh, yeah, if you were gay. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't literally read the tweet, which is a joke, not maybe a funny one, but he pulls it apart and makes it sound like he would hit the kid over, literally hit the kid with a dollhouse if he was, because it's gay. That was a joke to Kevin. But the truth is, that is a reality for many little boys in the United States. Ah! Somewhere... A black dad is beating his black son. Okay, now you've got my attention, Don Lemon. He's talking about violence in the black... Uh, not, I'm not going to say community. He says it all the time. He's saying black Americans beat their children. The same way it happened to my friend, Oscar-nominated director Lee Daniels, who through his TV show Empire portrayed how, as a little boy, his dad threw him in a trash can for wearing heels. And now somehow we've magically transformed from being gay 
to wearing heels, and I don't think it's a prerequisite that you are gay as a child that you wear heels. But okay, Don, I'll take your word for it. Took him out of the house and threw him in the trash can. That's a reality for a lot of little boys. Those views of the LGBT people within the black community have consequences. So think of this, okay? We're about facts okay. here. This is a news okay. organization. The Center for American Progress says that 40... Did, we're fa- did you hear that? We're a fact-based organization. Let me just get some facts for community you. ...community have consequences. So think of this, okay? We're okay. about facts here. This is a news organization. The Center for American Progress says that 44% of homeless gay youth are black. That's uh-huh. huge. Remember, black people only make up 12% of the U.S. population. I like how he uses this statistic. Because when it's about uh, violence, uh, let's just take one against uh, uh, police officers getting killed or um, if it's about uh, crime. When someone says, hey, man, the black population in America is only 12 percent, yet they're responsible for more X, Y, Z. Then you're a horrible bigot and an a-hole and you can't say these things. But now Don can use the statistic. This guy but he doesn't even use the statistic. He uses the the derivative, which is very misleading. Extremely. Homeless gay youth are black. That's huge. Remember, black people only make up 12 percent of the U.S. population. Those kids were likely kicked out of their homes or had to run away because of who they are and because of how our community treats them. Now, when he's saying community, he means black community. He's telling me that black Americans are more homophobic than white than any other color Americans. I find this to be a f- real outrage. And we have to talk about outreach. Ellen, a trailblazer and respected leader in the LGBT community. She really is. She almost lost her entire career for coming out, for being a trailblazer, doing it first. She gave Kevin the opportunity to tell his story on her show. That is an olive branch if I have ever seen one. She says that she forgives Kevin and thinks that he should host the Oscars. But honestly, Ellen doesn't speak for the whole community. Oh, oh, big mistake, Ellen. You don't speak for the whole community. And this is where Don is finally going to tell us that there is no such thing as a community and he's full of crap. We need to speak up for the young black people, especially young black men, kids in the LGBT community. Uh I'm a gay black man. I don't know what it's like to be a, 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 a white lesbian. What? What? Aren't you in the same community? You're telling me that you're in the same community as a black gay man and you don't understand what it's like to be a lesbian white woman? What kind of a community is that? Especially Not much young of one. black men, kids in the LGBT community. I'm a gay black man. I don't know what it's like to be a, 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 a white lesbian. I, I don't know. <laughs> if someone called me and they had an issue and said, hey, Don, you don't know what it's like to be a lesbian. You don't know what it's like to be a white man. You don't know what it's like to be a woman. I would listen to them. Oh. So I'm saying these issues need to be addressed, especially when it comes to black youth in our country, because they need to know that, that they have so value. so smug and self-righteous. Oh, yeah. He's the king. He's the king of the gays now. That's, that's how he's portraying himself. The king yeah. of the community. And it's okay to be who they are. We in the, in the African-American community... Have, I'm sorry, he's the king of the blacks now. We have to stop low-key co-signing homophobia. It is not cool. So, wow, man. Is this true? Is this true? That it goes something deeper than skin color? That, or that it is just black? Black Americans are more homophobic than the rest. Is that what he's saying? That's what it, he might be saying. That's what it I, sounds it, like to me. I, that's what sounds like what he's saying. But I don't know how he can make that assertion. He doesn't even know how a white, white lesbian, lesbian thinks. Feels. How does he know how a white anybody else thinks? And so, how can he make that that generalization? No, if he's he, doing if he it. No, he, this is the this, uh, twenty minute, twenty seconds left, and we won't tolerate jokes. That tell those youth otherwise. Oh, so we can't have jokes now. Because apologizing and moving on does not make the world a better place for people who are gay or people who are transgender. Being an ally does. So, Kevin, no one is against you. No one said that you should be fired or any of that. What they want for you is to bring light to this, to be an ally. So it is your chance right now to do the right thing, to change minds and possibly save lives. (laughs) Okay, Don, thanks for counting on a comedian to save lives. but. Why is it that all I hear is it's white alt-right people who hate gays? 
That's all I hear. And here's Don Lemon in 10 minutes saying that it's it's worse with blacks. Yeah, I, have, I have no answer right. for all of this, but it just irked me. Apparently. He's, he's generalizing a whole bunch of things here. And that is not cool, Don Lemon. That is not cool. Generalize. Well, they had Chris Rock on as the uh, host twice in mm-hmm. a row because they liked him. Yeah. I don't know why they just don't bring him back. No, I, you know, I listened to the, I don't know, did we talk about this last time? I listened to the Louis C.K., one of his recent stand-ups. And I got to tell you, something broke. He's, it, nothing he says is funny. Oh, uh, it's, it's societal. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's broken. It's, well, it's, here's a good example. Um. You can find one of these old, the thousand funniest jokes, Mm -hmm. but I'm not talking about buying one off the shelf at a bookstore. I'm talking about going to a used bookstore and buying the thousand funniest jokes or any of the Bennett surf books where he collects all these jokes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these are all, I'm talking about ones printed in the fifties and sixties, pull those books off the shelf and tell me if there's any joke in the book that's funny. You won't find one. No, they're just not funny anymore. They're just not funny. But, but Louis C.K. Yeah, you have to say, was it funny then? It probably was. I don't. You see, and here's the now. Here's another problem I have. I did take the folklore classes from Alan Dundas at the University of California, and a lot of it was focused on jokes. The problem I have with the thesis about these time, the timeliness of jokes is is the folklorist uh, named Legman who did The Rationale of the Dirty Joke, Volumes 1 and 2. Rationale of the Dirty Joke is dirty jokes, and probably dirty jokes uh, from the starting in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. These are all old jokes, because he goes back to the original joke that made this particular category what it was. And he has all these different categories, joke categories you don't even have anymore, like jokes about American Indians. You can read many of these jokes, and I would say not all of them, but at least half of them are still funny. The dirty jokes. Yeah, the dirty jokes. I can see that. So I'm just kind of baffled by, you know, what is the non-dirty societal jokes that are talking about, you know, daily life? Why is Louis C.K. not funny anymore? I don't know, but... He just wasn't. I think it's also, you know, you can make comebacks in America. We're great at it. We Everyone gets at least one comeback shot. <clears throat> but when you, when you come back, you got to eat pie, man. You got to eat humble pie. You got to just, you he know. He refuses. You, you got to make fun of yourself. He doesn't. The first thing out of his mouth is, I lost $35 million. How's your day going? You know, it's wrong. And I think that, because I, that's your opening joke. No, no It's good. not a joke to get much sympathy from no, anybody. No, no. So he's screwing up the great American tradition of the of the the comeback kid. And it's over now for him in my book. Well, he's you know, the comeback can be re engineered as possible. Mm, I'm not seeing but it. But from the looks of it, if he's gonna keep <laughs> from, on this I'm not seeing it. <laughs> on, if he's gonna stay on this path of, of yeah. being adamant. Yeah. I mean his his attitude is look. I talked about these things that I've been accused of in my material. It's not like news to anybody that I'm like a masturbator. Uh, and, and so he resents the fact that yes. it's turned back on him. Yes. And instead of seeing what was wrong, what's wrong with this picture and, and doing what he's supposed to do, which he doesn't know how to do. That's part uh, of the problem. He just is irked. Yeah. Which that makes most comics who are irked. They're not uh, funny. They're not going to be funny. Right. Oh, well. So, Pay attention, people. This is so how I not to do it. I watch the Kevin Hart, Ellen thing. What came of it? It's nothing. Who cares? Nothing's coming she's of it. still not going to do the show. No, I think Ellen wants to do the show. I think she's vying she's for it. She's done it before. Yeah, she would want to go back. That's what I'm thinking. But uh, I don't know. They don't you know, want her back. More importantly, I really, really don't care. Ah, uh, well, you cared enough to do a segment. That was different. It's Don Lamont. Are you kidding me? He's the king of all blacks and gays of the communities. All right, let's go back to some of the clips from 19, uh, 2009. 
These are that now I realize what this bit is. These are clips from 2009, but the within the clip it could be something older, like the 2000 or the 1988 uh, Al Gore thing. Right. And for example, a good example of a 2009 clip mm -hmm. is the Taylor Swift clip, which used to be a classic on this show. Hold on. Going back to 2009, when John first identified the talent of a then very young Taylor Swift. Frustrated, but Taylor's strive for perfection yeah. only makes the people who work with this young star respect her that much more. Let's go! There's been times where I've played a solo and then she'll say, well, can you kind of do this? And she'll sing me a melody. I'll incorporate that. And, and uh, that's very impressive for someone her age. The, the problem that I was having with the solo is that it like it's getting a little noodly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> noodly. Um, I'd rather it be like. Less, less notes. That would be great. Let's try it again. I. I remember this, and I remember being very skeptical of your adoration of the young Taylor, <laughs> and how wrong I was. Yeah, I saw this coming down broad. Yeah, you, you were so right. chops. You were so right. A slouch. You were so right. On the money. Um, can I bring us back? To well, uh, no, don't bring us back because I got one more. Okay, and that way we don't have to go back again. Oh, good. It's now this was our, one of the early. This is one of the early jobs karmas. Oh, from 2009, where we had uh, or we had the Nancy Pelosi thing incorporated with an old Dick Powell clip from one of the old Broadway musicals that was turned into a TV show or to a movie. Dick Powell. Say, have you got something with kind of a march effect, march rhythm to it? Yes, I have. I have something about a forgotten man, but I don't have any words to it yet. Well, play it. Play it. I tell you, I just got the idea for it last night. I was down on Times Square watching those men in the bread line. Standing there in the rain, waiting for coffee and donuts. Men out of a job, around the soup kitchen. Stop! Go on. That's it. That's what this show's about. The depression. Men marching, marching in the rain. Donuts and colors. Men marching, marching. Jobs, jobs. Let's vote for jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Is that, is that the clip you edited back then? Yeah. That's oh, that's, fan was a that's fantastic. Yeah, I was doing good work. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. That's what I like to know. <laughs> All right, we're back. Um, this is, uh, I have a presentation, a couple of clips. Uh, it's very much for us, uh, but I think in looking at tomorrow, the Brexit movie will be released in the UK. It will be aired on Channel 4, and it also, I believe it drops. Uh, in the U.S. on HBO. This is a propaganda piece. It has big names in it. It's a propaganda piece to uh, tell everyone that the algos ripped them off in the Brexit vote and the timing could not be more perfect because today again we read that everybody wants a do-over, something yeah. we predicted from day one because that's the way yeah. it works. And uh, so it looks like they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. Now, comic strip blogger. He uh, was posting in noagendasocial.com, which is our Mastodon Federated node. Uh, by the way, as an aside, I figured out what, why um, Mastodon is, has, doesn't have the toxicity of Twitter. It's, it hit me all of a sudden. Okay. And this is something that was not in the original Twitter design. The ability to retweet with a comment... So you can boost a post on Mastodon, but you can't add a comment. So, you know, so a true boost, like on a, a, a retweet on Twitter, which is a user-demanded function, by the way. People were doing it RTs. It wasn't there originally. No, the users demanded it. They were, they were using Well, people, this. well, there was an element of that, but at the same time, users were going RT. Yep. And then cutting and pasting another, but somebody else's tweet. Right. And Twitter felt that was giving the users too much personal power, and so they came up with the retweet button. And 
that actually made things worse because now you retweet, it shows up as a tweet on your timeline, not a reply. Replies don't usually show up that quickly. Uh, it shows it shows your followers a retweet, and you could add any snarky comment or whatever right. comment you want, and that is what starts the virality. This does not exist within uh, the Mastodon system. Uh. And the, the guy, Gargon, whatever in his name, he says, I'm not putting it in. He says, I'm not putting it in because that is exactly what ruined Twitter. And I think it's a very astute observation. I think could that's be. the RTs with comment is to blame. Anyway, so comics are bloggers in there. And, you know, he's an expert in machine learning now. So he claims. Now, I've known this guy since early, early, early Daily Source Code days. I mean, way before this he's show. Huge uh, orig- OG, original he's fan. OG. And I have no idea what he does. I know he doesn't make money on his cartoons. And it hit me all of a sudden. He's my handler. Oh, God. Think about it. He, cause <laughs> he always wants you, like, you don't say anything about Poland. Right? And it gets all pissed off. But he stays. 20 years almost. He stays. I think, you know, if you look back in his history, I think he was in the tech in- I think he was probably some kind of agent uh, and then Microsoft kicked him out because he was, you know, telling the dude too many things to their system. And I think whoever he works for, if it's the Russians or some, whoever, you know, Interpol, I don't know who he works for. But he clearly got demoted and they said, here, do this podcast guy. He, he's, he's your target now. Because he stays. It doesn't, you know, he'll get pissed off about something. It's always something in the show. He can't quit. That we do. He can't. We, I am his target. He's not I am, allowed to quit. He's not allowed to quit. So anyway. Uh, he now he says he's, you know as silly as this sounds it's not that silly it's a possibility it really could be he's, he's like the guy that couldn't handle the big job so they gave him me <laughs> handle that guy oh jason all right so it doesn't matter I, I i he's a part he's a part of our experience and i appreciate him for that he does some good art he does some great art too. he's a great contributor and sometimes yeah. he's right but handler so he's posting about, oh, this proves machine learning. And I kind of misunderstood what he was saying because he, he posted a video of Dominique Cummings at some kind of marketing uh, conference. Dominique Cummings is the Brad Parscale of Brexit. This is the guy who did all of the vote leave campaign and you know, the Facebook campaign. And he explains exactly how he did it. And we like this stuff. It's interesting because, you know, these days, Facebook and other social networks are seen as, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's both a fantastic tool because you can get stuff done. You can change the electric's thinking. At the same time, the Russians could use it and change the electorate's thinking. So it's a very, it's a very, it's uh, mysterious and it's scary. And what do we do with it? And for us... I think is just as interesting as listening to how uh, the digital campaign for Trump ran as to hear what he did and his conclusions, this Dominique Cummings, for the Brexit campaign. And I thought you'd be interested, too. This yeah. Is, yeah, okay. Uh, so we'll start off with the messaging. Um, so well, we worked out uh, essentially what I call... Oh, by the way, the guy has a bit of Tourette's and he's a stutterer, so you know, it's... I. Cut thanks, some, thanks for that. I cut well because otherwise we'll just be going. Uh, 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 uh. But in this case, we got to listen to him. Um, so well, we worked out uh, essentially what our core message would be, and it had uh, it was very simple. It had f- arguably um, f- say five elements to it. The first was the theme of take back control. Uh, note the word back uh, triggering um, uh, loss aversion, the feeling that something has been lost and we can regain what, what we've lost, which, which I think was uh, 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 interesting. Um, and it worked on different levels. It wasn't, it was, the most obvious level was we've got to take back control from Brussels, but it was also, uh, and I think David Cameron and George Osborne didn't quite appreciate this, it was also about taking back control from, uh, of, of, the, of the system itself. It was for a lot of people, take back control made them think, yeah, these are the guys who screwed up the economy, who drove off a cliff in 2008, whose mates are all the Goldman Sachs bankers and the hedge funders on massive bonuses. Us mugs on PAYE are the ones paying the, paying the bills for this. We'll show those guys. We'll take back control from you lot in London. Um, and I think that was a, that was a powerful um, feeling. 
So there you go. Taking it back, this is just marketing. This is nothing special, by the way. Taking it back was the message. Take it back, and that was what they decided upon early on, and they liked it. But then they went to some academics and found persuasion studies, persuasive uh, usage of words and tactics that had actual formulas attached to it. So, again, nothing really crazy. If uh, There's tons of focus groups done on what persuasive tactics work. Marketing is persuasion. And so they brought in the guys who done some studies. So we had to do things, in, 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 we had to take risks and we had to do things uh, in, in a slightly new way. Um, so one of the basic things that, that I did was I brought in a team of physicists uh, who essentially looked at campaigning from complete first principles. And what they did was they went, they simply scanned around the world and they said, what studies have been done on issues of turnout and persuasion that actually have good maths behind them to support and have been replicated and we can actually have confidence in? And they basically filtered all, went through, filtered them all out and came back to me and the team and said, here is a small selection of of things of actually high quality or reasonable quality work which you can rely upon. And here are the principles that you can see in these studies that have been replicated with randomised control trials and whatnot in the States. Um, we basically created a checklist of what these things were and we built the communications team around trying to exploit each of these elements which the, which the, um, which the physicists found. Um, they also constructed models to help direct resources on the, for the ground campaign, so where do you actually send your activists, and the digital campaign, how do you actually do that in a, in a scientific way. And essentially, you had uh, uh, streams of data coming in from all sorts of different ways, the website, email, on the ground, canvassing, uh, social media, blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff, traditional polling, all of this stuff coming in, uh, and you had the data science people sitting at the heart of the operation and essentially taking our core messages and just running experimentally um, a whole bunch of different things on Facebook and elsewhere and then figuring out what, what things work and what things don't work. And we started off with relatively small amounts of money just to run this experimental process. So there's your A-B testing. You had a small, a small data set of proven persuasion techniques and what I found interesting, which comes back in a minute, is he was also getting feedback from the, the campaigners on the ground. This is never mentioned. Uh, but people with boots on the ground who would go door to door. And, they, and this is the only time machine learning was used. They changed the way, and this is important, they changed what they used as polling data. And he explains. We did a new kind of polling. So I'm sure all of you know. The polling methodology used uh, throughout um, the world is essentially the same system that was invented in the late 1930s. And the idea of it is, you know, you take, roughly speaking, a thousand-person sample, uh, and if it's random and representative, then you can rely on the mathematics of the normal distribution, the famous bell curve, and you, that should give you a pretty accurate picture of, of what people think. For various reasons, that is becoming harder and harder to do. Uh, happy to answer questions about why that is. Um, but leaving that aside, what the physicist said was, this is actually not the way that you would invent polling if you were going to invent polling now. Um, the way actually to do it is take massive samples of hundreds of thousands of people, ideally actually um, millions of people, but say hundreds of thousands of people, and then use machine learning, uh, and you will actually have uh, a system which is faster, cheaper, uh, more accurate. And it has another great advantage, which we exploited, which is that if you do these very large sample surveys, you then have subsample. You can define the demographics that you uh, interrogate yourself. And what we did was we basically used the exact same categories for the demographics that Facebook uses for its digital advertising platform. So we sucked in data on the precise same basis that Facebook marketing allows. And then we had, therefore, large subsamples of the overall polling samples, which you could actually rely on. And then you could take that data and plug it straight back into Facebook. So we could say, for example, we will target uh, women between 35 and 45 who live in these particular geographical uh, entities who don't have a degree or who do have a degree or whatever, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and because you've got very large samples, you can actually get useful information on those kind of relatively small um, um, breakdowns.
Now, I'm no marketing expert, but this sounds just like regular old cross-indexing to me. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you could say that. I think it's right. I, I mean, think you say that. I mean, I think it's I mean machine, machine learning in this case is just... Well, machine learning is bull crap. Yeah. I mean, that part we know is yeah. it's just nothing. It's just a... Just, have, there is no such thing no. as machine learning. The machines don't learn anything. It was just the ability to cross-reference, cross-index these categories to yeah, drill like down. Yeah, card sorter. So, so exactly. So, um, this is what that resulted in. So, we did all this, um, and we, as I said, we essentially ran a whole series of, of, of experiments based on what we found in the conventional polling and the focus groups uh, out in the digital world, and then filtered what, what worked. Um, and then we held back almost all of our budget, and then we basically dumped the entire budget uh, in the last 10 days, and really in the last three or four days. Again, exactly what the Trump campaign did, held back and then just blew millions in the last week, in the last few days, based upon weeks and weeks of A-B testing. Um, uh, This is exactly what the media does not want to be passed around. Exactly. And we aimed it at, I can't remember exactly, but I think roughly about 7 million people um, saw something like, I think, a billion and a half, one and a half billion um, digital ads uh, uh, over a relatively short short period of time. Um, uh, and in parallel to that, you had the whole ground operation, which were also, to begin with, they were quite sceptical about this. What the hell is some guy who babbles on about quantum mechanics? What does he have to tell people who, like me, have been going out to leaflet on doorsteps for 30 years? So people were very sceptical, but uh, the people on the ground, you know, if, you, if you're doing that job, you actually respond well to things that work. So very quickly they came back and said, actually, these boffins have sent us to the right place. It's unbelievable. These, these, these are our people. Um, so quickly, that kind of trust issue was, was sorted out inside the, organiza- inside the organization, and the ground team were happy to go where the data suggested that, they, that their efforts would be most useful. So I think this ground team is undervalued in the overall uh, scheme of things, because they were basically saying, here's where the people live, go knock on their doors, and they were getting good results. Um, to... Um one major item that is no longer discussed as a part of the Brexit vote, and that was the, I think it was, was it Jill Dando who was murdered? Was that her, or was this the wrong one? I don't remember. Uh, it doesn't, I don't know. Yeah, it's the uh, the murder, the woman who was murdered. She was a polar? No, no, she was a politician, wasn't she? Uh, Joe Cox, I'm sorry, Joe Cox. Yeah, she was okay. of the Labour Party. She was killed. And and this is no oh, right. longer... You're talking about in the UK. Okay. In the UK, yes. Jill Dando was a different killing. No, this was Jill Cox, and she was killed on June 16th. And that was, what, just a few weeks before the, before the Brexit vote? And that changed things dramatically. But the elites, they had a different view as to what the rest of the country had. And this guy, of course, saw that in his mass polling data. Um, and our campaign took advantage of it. You know, we operated oh, on. I'm sorry. Hold on. This is wrong clip. Here we go. Why did this happen? Was it just immigration? No, it wasn't just immigration. Giving people a chance to vote for the NHS as well as voting against the EU. Uh, without that, then the economic scares of the establishment would have been too powerful, and we would have lost. Could we have won without immigration? Absolutely not. The, the reality of it is that those three big forces that I talked about created the conditions in which we could win, but then you had the government making a series of big mistakes and you had a, 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 our team which, which managed to exploit it. And their mistakes essentially were their renegotiation was a disaster. Unlike in 1975 when Wilson pulled the same trick, um, there he persuaded people that the relationship had changed and therefore the polls moved. This time, no one believed what Cameron came back with. And in particular, Cameron never understood the danger for him of coming back and saying essentially nothing had changed on immigration. Um, they also, I think, ran a bad campaign. They relied on people on MNC Saatchi and various big advertising agencies who did a, 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 a fairly rubbish job. And they, and they lived in the bubble. And you can see that in the last 10 days after the terrible murder. Um, uh, they essentially uh, changed, ditched their whole campaign and, uh, uh, and stop talking about economic risks and turn the whole thing just into, well, we're the good people and you're, and you're the bad people. Because that was the self-reinforcing culture that you heard in London. Whereas, in fact, as soon as you went outside the N25 and did market research, the rest of the country had a totally different reaction to the murder than, uh, than, um, than people, uh, better educated, richer people living in London did. 
So without the fear of the immigrant fear, without the uh, NHS fear that uh, you'll be paying $350 million extra a week or whatever it was in your health care, um, it never would have worked. But they also completely misjudged the Joe Cox murder. And to wind it up, he's going to shoot a big middle finger to the media the people who are supposed to know better and know how these things work. Um, and our campaign took advantage of it. You know, we operated on we just on very, very simple, tried and tested rules that work about organisations. We kept the MPs out of all management. No MP had anything to do with the management of the campaign. It was run by about six or ten people, uh, the oldest of which was me, the youngest of whom was 21. So we kept the team small. Uh, they worked extremely hard. They made a lot of sacrifices. And they focused on the public, not on the media and not on the insider uh, um, on the inside of game. Um, I think in the long run, some of the things that we try to do, you can see all the parties now are trying to learn from, all the parties are trying to learn from some of the things that we did. Um, uh, I don't think they do, they've done a very good job, either of them, in, the last, in this last campaign. Uh, the reality is that most communications companies are populated by bullshitting charlatans. <laughs> and most of them should be fired. And I think that in the next 10 years, a massive chunk of them will be fired. And people in Silicon Valley and others will increasingly take over this industry the way that they've taken over other industries. And if you've got a not very good degree in English or gender studies or something like that, then you're very rapidly going to get, um, I think, you're going to get fired. And the industry will go through the kind of change that other industries have seen. And there you go. Gender studies. <laughs> gender studies. <laughs> Yeah, you can get a degree in gender studies. Yes. That's really a winner. Well, that was interesting. I think it was a little long. Yeah. I think it was. I think some people may have been bored. I liked it because I'm interested in this stuff to an extreme. Yes. And uh, well, why why I think it was important to do I, it a l little longer is that if we watch this movie Monday, I wonder how much of the truth of what he really did comes back into the creative product. Probably none. <laughs> I think it'll be. He got Facebook information and then you know. F did it you none. Know, propaganda none. <laughs> none none probably none this movie is a piece of propaganda obviously and it's designed for exactly what you said i definitely want to watch it mm -hmm. and it will probably have some effect but uh you know this constant hounding and hounding by the media i mean they, they can't really be overlooked even though he thinks that you know these guys are a bunch of screw-ups but it can't be overlooked it's not how the never-ending hounding and hounding i mean when i go to the bank the other day and like one of the tellers is depressed and you know she thinks that world's coming to an end and all the rest of it she's watching the news and news, yeah. she's watching the network news and it's just not not a healthy environment for most people. But the conundrum just stay off a of TV. I mean, so I'm, we're not the only people seeing this. There's you know, there's people in Washington D.C. and other political centers oh, of power. A lot of people seeing this, and they see this. And so here's the conundrum: Do we all go out and hire this guy or guys like him and and dive into this, or do we see the danger uh, that anyone could do this, and do we anyone need to regulate this. it? Nothing to regulate. No, but, but, the, but this, just targeted advertising is just a form of. I, well, I know, I purposes. know, but you got to put yourself into a moronic. No uh, one's going to do it. You official. can't do anything about it. No, but they will try. Well, they're just wasting time. They should probably <laughs> learn from the guy. Yeah, I'm always surprised. It's just, it's the same way. You got to repeat the the right message over and over and over again. To the right people. Yeah, but so what else is new? The guy just found the people. Right, he used a new methodology to find the people. Yeah. I mean, that's what these the marketing people have always been doing all their lives, is from the beginning of the idea to the end, to the most recent, they're just trying to find these people. That's why Facebook is so appealing, because they claim they've got a key to the kingdom. they got a way of finding the people you're looking for. Yeah. You're looking for this person because this person wants to buy your product. We have them right here in this little box. <laughs> I am so happy we don't have to do that. No, we. No, what I actually enjoy about this show is that our audience is everybody. In fact, I, we did a meetup on Friday. Yes, I tell me about, about the meetup. Yes. So this is boots on the ground for me. Um, you got, we had about 30 two to 37 people show up, which was a lot because it was a flash meetup. We just threw it together in the last minute. How many people? About 37. Not bad for a flash. No, not bad. Not bad. That's very good, and, actually. 
And it was all, you know, the t- classic no agenda mavens, a little different, slightly different uh, in that there were a little more academics, I think, than, for example, in Seattle, there's very few. Uh, by academics, I don't mean they're professors. I mean they work uh, at the university. Uh, there's a, at least two or maybe three librarians there. Oh, uh, including uh, some interesting ones. Did they have? Uh, and, did they? Uh, have, well, stop, stop, stop. Did they have uh, hair in a bun and glasses that they could then undo the bun? All men. Sh- oh, well, did they have a bun? <laughs> Hello. No, it's no, there were no men, man buns oh. in the in the place. Okay. Um, you know, I used to be a spokesperson for the uh, American Library Association. Give us your pitch. Uh, I don't remember. They used my picture on uh, posters. Oh, okay. I was more well, a poster boy. I wasn't a spokesperson. Face. I was a poster boy. Literally You're poster boy. Face. Yeah. Uh, and it was a good group. I learned a lot. Uh, I got some interesting little tidbits, which I'll bring into the show. I don't have today. I didn't bring their uh, the, the the contributions in the prescribed envelope are still in a in a base. In processing. I'm going to put them in a Thursday show. Did Mimi take but, them home again? Sorry? <laughs> Did Mimi take the envelope home? No, there's not. A, it's a bunch of envelopes. You get a bunch of envelopes. Just kidding. And they're in back, my back pocket. That's where they immediately go and then they get <laughs> ferreted processed, away. Processed, processed. Um, but it was a good group and it was a, a good place. It's Gilman Brewery's a kind of a Belgian beer house, mm-hmm. brow house. And it's, they make interesting products, including a lager that's quite tasty. Um. Anyway, it was but this we need to do more of these. But you can, t- t- I did have one guy, which I luckily JC was there, and JC could talk the talk when it comes to this sort of thing. This guy is Polish, big guy, and he's uh, going on. And he's he's a troubleshooter for a bunch of Silicon Valley operations right now, looking for work. Mm-hmm. And he's giving reading me the riot act about how the Silicon Valley's turned into a bunch of left wingers, and this has to do with agile, the 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 reason, the style of uh, of work that you where it's like a lot of hold on, explain like, this agile. What is this? Agile is just in a nutshell is where you bullshit your everybody's bullshitting each other, so there's no oh you no, fake it till you make no, it. <laughs> no, nothing ever gets done, mm. and it's and he's got this theory that this creates a lying environment, which is called, which is fit for the lefties. Anyway, it's huh. a long story, but he wants us to cover this more. He goes, you you're not talking about how terrible it is in Silicon Valley and how they all become left wingers. I said, well, when I was a kid, they were all right wingers, and he says you should cover that more. And I try to say to him, and I'm going to say it to everybody else who tries to get us to do certain things: we deconstruct the news. We don't initiate coverage unless there's something that initiates it for us. Uh, I mean, we have out of the blue come up with a couple of little things that look like we initiated. But in fact, it comes from information that we're deconstructing. And if, and there's nothing to deconstruct here. The, the Silicon Valley is just a bunch of a-holes. And this is not <laughs> as far as you can go. Hey, well done. You nailed it. Yeah, you nailed it. And so, and it's and it's just sometimes it's very hard to get people to realize we're not investigative reporters. We're not, you know, we are deconstructionists. Period. And that's what we do. And if there's nothing to deconstruct, there's nothing for us to talk about. But there's plenty to deconstruct, let alone start making stuff up. So uh, I think so I, I said, well, you know, you should talk to my son. And so I put JC over there who could talk for days about management in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I'll bet. And so that was uh, – I put him over there, and the, the hour later he's still there. You know, he's this guy's – it's it's funny to watch. It's like a heavyweight boxing champion. Did you talk to anyone else? Was there any – I any- talked to a lot of people. I didn't talk to that guy that much because I, I couldn't keep hearing this. I talked to everybody. I, there wasn't maybe one or two people. Right. I talked to some guy could keep – I talked about football with a guy from Alabama and his mm-hmm. girlfriend are moving to Arizona. Eventually I talked, I talked about it. It was very, it was a great meetup. Lots of good ch- conversations. Good. Good. I remember uh 22nd of February is the uh, Boise, Idaho, not Boise, Idaho, the Des Moines, Iowa meetup. Is it, that's what people have been pestering me about 22nd of February. Yes. Yes. Who would go who, to it? Yeah, hello. <laughs> it's because we're there that there's a meetup. Okay. Yeah. And that 22nd, we're actually flying in early to do the meetup. That's, uh, Good. I think it's you a should be able to pack them in. I have no idea how many producers we have, uh, uh in, uh, in the Midwest. No idea. You, they'll come in from Chicago. Yeah, they might. 
They might. And Milwaukee. So lots of time to plan for that. And actually, we had dinner with uh, with Marks or Mark, the uh, our staff documentarian last night. He's all jacked about uh, Mark Hall. He's yeah, all Mark jacked Hall. about the Texas meetup. Which is still in the works, people. Stay tuned. It's coming. I promise you. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda. In the morning. And I should mention the dude, uh, our, one of our dudes named Mohammed was at the uh, ah. meetup. Did he have his headgear on? No. <laughs> So let's thank a few people. We don't have that many on this list today, but let's start with Joseph Costello in Pittston, Pennsylvania. He's starting a Dame account for his lovely wife, Mary. <laughs> Wait, she, she this, this is good. Right here. Yeah. She used to tolerate my listening to the show, but has become a true fan. We had a lot of uh, anecdotal stories about that sort of thing. Good. At the meetup. Well, these are, this is the times where these things happen, where people turn. Yeah. Yep. Herb Lamb, one hundred ten dollars and ten. That was one hundred eleven dollars eleven cents. This Herb Lamb, one hundred ten dollars, Sir Herb Lamb to you, one hundred ten dollars and ten cents. Sir Herb Lamb, the Vi- he's the Viscount of Georgia. Yes. Uh, Sir Austin of the Snowy Cascades, one hundred ten dollars and ten cents in Sammamish, Washington. And he says he'd like karma for his wife Laura. Big big week next week for her in job search with multiple interviews. Yes, coming up for her. Jonathan Hess, one hundred ten dollars in Deutschland. Hello, Deutschland. Uh, Hess, Hess. Hess. Uh, Rick Cable, $100. Now, he wants karma for his son, Matt Cable, who's deploying overseas this week for a seven-month deployment. Put that at the end. Hey, listen, he says his son, Matt, was actually on The Rock's new fitness challenge show, Titan yeah. Games. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we got that guy, too. We yeah. got a loose guy. Who's we got, got, we got, got a, a Titan. We got a you know, Those guys that are on those those challenge shows are tough guys. It's no joke. All right, karma coming up for him. Of course, those shows are meant to humiliate these people. No, not Matt. Dane Coleman, eighty two oh five. He's going to be a knight. He's going to be the knight at night today. I'm going to read his notes since he's becoming a knight. Today I become a knight of the No Agenda Roundtable. The show has been a consistent and significant part of my life. For the better part of my 20s and into my 30s, helping me to laugh at the news, think critically, and maintain reason and response in this age of political poppycock and climate fear-mongering. I'd like to be known as Sir Dane the Great, and I'm requesting Highlander Grog and Hash Brownies at the round table. Let me make sure I order that so it's there. And requesting Small Business Karma, please. He co-founded a design and digital media company at... Uh, R-U-E-F dot com Roof Ruef R-U-E-F dot com Cheers fellas Keep up the fantastic work The show is always stellar But has been on fire lately Thank you very much And I'm putting your request At the table as we speak So he's actually named he's, the, his, his name is a pun on Great Dane the giant dog Yes Tim White 8008 Our one and only boob today uh, Sir Phenom, 6960 in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, Richard Terry in Houston, Texas, 5510. Michael Gates, 5280. And the following people, as we wrap it up quickly, uh, are all $50 donors, name and donations, starting with Paul Van Cordelar in Eimuden. Oh, almost. Eimuden. Eimuden. Very good. And, and for some reason, when you, and I should tell this to people, when you're saying these, uh, Dutch names you have to you have to yell. Yes, <laughs> yes, doesn't work otherwise. Hey, my God, Alexander Font Fonteris, I think Fonteris, Fonteris, maybe in Jacksonville, Florida. Todd Moore in Arlington, Virginia. Andrew Martin in Sydney, New South Wales, uh, Australia. V- Victor Munoz in Miami. Andre Metetic. Parts unknown. Villarreal, Villarreal in Mercedes, Texas, and Matthew Janiszewski, Sir Matthew to you. Matthew Janiszewski, Sir Matthew. Uh, in Chicago, and last but not least, uh, Brett Farrell over in, Sir Brett Farrell over in Oklahoma City. At least that's where I think he's from. That's where the bank is. Ah, His Dan, address is never on the check. 
And Richard Terry with his double nickels on the dime uh, wanted some F cancer karma as well. So we'll make sure make sure we put that in. All right, short list today. Yeah. Short list, short sheeted. <laughs> it was it a is. holiday week. So. We do want to thank everybody, of course, uh, thanking those who came in under 50 for anonymity, which is the way to be anom- uh, to donate anonymously to the show. And, of course, we have our subscription programs. Uh, please check out Dvorak.org slash NA and uh, get in on any uh, program that you can to join the Value for Value Network and support the programming and the work. And you can do that again. Said at Dvorak.org. Slash Here's the karma sequence. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. You've got karma. And, interestingly, zero birthdays today. Huh. Not a single one. It is odd. Yeah, that rarely happens. However, we do have one nighting to take care of, so we'll get Dane Coleman up here once you got your blade up. Let me get this thing out of here. Here you go. All right, perfect. All right, Dane, hey, hey, step on up. Thank you very much for your support of the Value for Value Network, known as the No Agenda Show in the amount of $1,000 or more. Very proud to bring you up here and to pronounce to Kate you, Sir Dane the Great. Yes, for you, we have hookers and blow, rent boys and chardonnay, Highlander grog and hash browns, cookies and vodka, warm beer and cold women. We got single malt scotch. We got craw, ship and cane breaks. We got Cooper's pale ale and kanga bangers. We got Dr. Pepper and a quick handy, onion rings and ice cream, Captain Morgan's and women with questionable reputation, Polish potato vodka, sparkling cider and escorts, bong hits and bourbon, gauges and sock egg, ginger ale and gerbils, and mutton and mead. And for you, Sir Dane the Great, we have a ring, sealing wax, and certificate ready. Just go to noagendanation.com slash rings. Give Eric the Shill all your information, and he'll take care of that for you post-haste. And thank you for supporting the No Agenda Show. Okay. Uh, mm. Well, what do we got? I got a couple things. I was hoping you would have a some oh, I got a to, bunch of stuff left here. Yeah, yeah wrap some stuff uh, up. Let's, for well, let's do some. Here's some reports from that we don't get in the United States at all. I don't know why this one doesn't get some play, but let's play killing mayors in Mexico. <laughs> Yes, it's a new sport. They're killing them. It's a new sport. In Mexico, human rights groups and family members are demanding justice after the mayor of a town in the southern state of Oaxaca was gunned down New Year's Day, just hours after taking office. Alejandro Aparicio was surrounded by supporters and publicly touring city offices when he was shot on the street. The gunman was pinned to the ground until police could arrive to arrest him. He's been described as a 34-year-old former police officer from northern Mexico. Aparicio's widow, Victoria Feria, believes the killer and not did not act on his own we want to do everything possible to clarify this murder because there can be no impunity that is what we are asking for as a family to clarify the killing and to support us Aparicio was a member of the progressive party of Mexican president Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador his death came as human rights researchers said 175 Mexican politicians were killed over a 12 month period ending last August jeez Dropping like flies. <laughs> Way to go, man. They want to run in our country. Yeah. Another un- I don't know why this didn't get more play because you could have had a lot of fun with it. I only have a very short report from the Canadian Broadcasting Company on the German hack. Oh, yes. There's very little. There's some European reporting that I picked up. I'm glad you have a clip. In Germany, hundreds of politicians at all levels of government have been hit by a massive data breach. It reportedly includes addresses, cell phone numbers, credit card details, internal communications. At least some of it was leaked through Twitter. We don't know who's behind the breach, but officials say all but one party was specifically targeted. Now, let's just stop for a second here. Let's stop for a second and ask which is the party that wasn't targeted. Uh, the AFD. Okay. Yeah, it's the you know the new guys, <laughs> the Trump guys, basically, the the, guys. the MAGA, right. the make the, the MAGAs, the Make Germany Great Again people, uh, the Alternativen für Deutschland AFD. But it wasn't just politicians; it was also celebrities. There's all kinds of uh, stuff in here, and it's from cloud accounts. It's not just from. Uh, in fact, thank you, cloud. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. It seems like. Uh, it seems like there's some good stuff out there. Uh, the same, you know, this... Um, if anybody, we have a lot of dudes in the event. If anyone can get us a 
I'm sure I don't know what the size of this file is, but I'd sure like to take a look at this stuff. Yeah. How about this Dark Overlord thing, though? This is not getting a lot of play, but I'm seeing people getting very worried about this. This is the um this is the group, the Dark Overlord, who on New Year's Eve says, Hey, we have eighteen thousand documents related to September eleventh, two thousand one terrorist attacks. In particular, uh, documentation about the insurance policies of, I guess, the World Trade Center, all buildings. Yeah, the guy who bought it, who bought the Trade Center, like, if, uh, not so long before the collapses. Yeah, it was Silverstein. Well, I thought that it was well known that he took out these big insurance policies just before the thing was leveled. Well, so they're slowly releasing pieces of information. Uh, which nothing earth shattering yet, but it does seem like people are in Washington are worried about this. Huh. I'm not quite sure why. What do they have to hide? There must be something. There must be something they're worried uh, about. And they say, "Pay the f up, or we're going to bury you in this." Says the Dark Overlord group or the Dark Overlord person. Uh, and what kind of money is he asking for? Are, uh, I don't think he's asking for money. Is he? No, he is asking for money. They are, what are they doing? Yeah, however, you'll be paying us. Yeah, so he wants to be paid, or they want to be paid. I guess they've released some decryption keys, which uh, do unlock some some documents. So they have some proof. Mm. Yeah, well, this is the same with um, the Tribune Company. That was a that was a total ransomware problem they ran into. Yeah, that was recent. Yeah, yeah. I thought the ransomware thing was over. I thought people had protections against that. Did they no. come up with some new scheme? No. Oh. <laughs> And then this obvious one. A spot the spook. Spot the yeah. spook. Everybody wants to spot the spook. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you, your clip is going to be similar to mine. Well, for the moment, this is Russia's word <laughs> against Waylon and Waylon's family. This is the American Waylon, uh, W-H-E-L-E-N, who has been detained in Russia as a spy. His word. Russia say that he was caught red-handed in the act of espionage, and Waylon's family insist he was just there for a wedding. Waylon's <laughs> lawyer is now seeking <laughs> bail, and Russian courts have till the 24th to decide. Russian media is also claiming now that Wayland spent the last decade developing a network of contacts in Russia using social media, leading up to his arrest last week, supposedly with a flash drive containing a list of employees from a secret Russian department. Wayland's family says he just loves traveling, he loves Russia, <laughs> and he was helping to arrange a friend's wedding. Uh -huh. Much remains unknown about Waylon, who lives in this house in Michigan. It's emerged that he is also a Canadian citizen, a <laughs> British citizen, possibly an Irish citizen. And today, the British foreign minister also spoke out. I'm telling you, you got four passports. He, you know, I love the cover. I, I talked to Agent Orange about this. The cover of him having an honorable discharge from the military. Total cover. This guy is a spook. Well, duh. Hello. There's like questions. Of, oh, what? Oh, this. Oh. And of course, it's retaliation for locking up the the Russian spy s Martina. What's her name? Yeah, I can't remember her name. Yeah, because they're not registered agents. You have to understand, in the intelligence game, you have registered agents. If you're an agent for another country, which usually means you're just paying off people with money, it's called lobbying in America. You're a spy, and you register. Yeah, be a diplomat. Spy. Diplomat, yeah. spy, same thing. Uh. And uh, if you don't, if you're not registered, and every country has unregistered agents in each other's countries, and you get caught, you know, or there's pretty much they're known to be agents— Hey, you take one of ours? Good. We're going to take one of yours. The difference is the FSB will actually tell everyone what this guy did. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't have anything on Bettina other than, well, she was lobbying. She was sleeping yeah, with, sleeping with people. Yeah, we probably don't know what she did. That's one of the reasons. It's one of the funny bits about it. So, yes, yeah, the no agenda confirms the guy's got to be a spook. Of course. Four passports. Oh, yeah. Well, he's just that passport hobbyist. I want to see how many countries I can become, uh, get a passport from. That's <laughs> yeah, my job. That's what I do. You really, I mean, so, he, you know, if you have a, it's not easy to get multiple passports as a U.S. citizen. They do complain, you know. They're like, what, do you want to be a U.S. citizen or something else? Well, in my daughter's case, my mom's Dutch. Okay. We'll allow that. But then, you know, what, I, I was, I, I, four different countries? Mm. No, 
No, <laughs> no. And that's all we no. know of. He may have other passports buried somewhere. You just don't know. Yes. All right. I don't have a clip on that. I just thought it would be worth discussing. I do have some more other weird stuff that is not being uh, discussed. Oh, we do have the flu season thing happening. It's not being promoted as much in this country, but apparently this last this batch of the flu has already killed a few people. But in Canada, they're all freaked out because it got off to an early start and started spreading before anyone could do much about it. So let's play our gratuitous and probably yearly flu season clip it is shaping up to be a particularly brutal flu season in canada now of course the flu can be more than just unpleasant it can be dangerous and even deadly well new numbers are out today and the number of cases has gone through the roof and one particular strain is doing most of the damage so far this flu season, there have been more than 13,000 lab-confirmed cases in Canada. 11,000 of those were variations of influenza A with H1N1 as the dominant strain. It's a big jump in cases, nearly 50% over this time last year, with about two-thirds of them hitting young, otherwise healthy adults. Those people who might not think they're particularly vulnerable. But that's how H1N1 tends to operate already. Wait a minute. Isn't this the swine flu? H1N1 is swine flu. I think H1N1 is swine flu, but it's not, but it's not version A. Oh. I think, because hmm. if, if it is anything close to swine flu, they always call it swine flu. Hmm. I don't know now that you mention it. You're right. 24 Canadians but. have died. Now, health officials say it's not too late to get the flu shot. Far from it. There are still months left in the season. And what's more, this year's vaccine is proving more effective than in years past. No, it's the bird flu. H1N1 is the bird flu. No, I thought H1N5 was the bird flu. Okay, kid, let it play out. With <laughs> we'll figure it out. As Cass Rusi tells us, that is welcome news for those who've been devastated by the virus in the worst possible way. There's Jude with his crackers. No, swine flu. The flu season is an unusually painful time of the year for Jill Promoli. In 2016, her little boy Jude died from the flu, even though he'd been vaccinated a few months earlier. So when we get to this point every year, it's it's stressful all over again and, and just really sad because I know there are going to be thousands of more families like mine where people are going to lose their lives and their loved ones from this preventable disease. Health officials have said it's rare for people to die from infectious diseases they've been vaccinated against. Bah, it is the swine flu. Yeah. H1N1 yeah. is the swine flu. Where's the... the no agenda, swine flu if I'd known That's that, no I'd idea. played the jingle. Well, this is Canada, so they're not pushing that, that meme. Uh. And maybe that has something to do with it. So bird flu is H5N1. Yeah, I remember getting swine flu when I was in San Francisco. What did it cost? <laughs> yeah, I just remember being in bed for a couple of days. I stopped smoking, and I was good. Hmm. I'm still did here. You take Tamiflu? No, no. I even knew you at the time. You hadn't even didn't even offer it to me. Just let me suffer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, buddy. I uh, don't remember this. This is a new story. Microservices architecture moving right along. Your speciality, your beat. My complaint. Your complaint, but also your beat. Uh, CenturyLink, the CenturyLink 911 network call outage. Uh, yeah. Did you look into this? Did you find out what this was? Yeah, it was a network, a, some sort of network card that blew up. It was just a hardware failure. Oh, and really? like with anything else in a microservices architected environment, one thing goes out, there's more than one or two single points of failure. And uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be. You can have redundancy if you were, but no, no. Why, why bother? I was able Whatever to. Whatever happened to the checksum? What happened to CRC? There were all these things that used to have memories. I remember when the IBM PC came out, they'd have a, you could buy cheap memory, which had all the bits. And then there was the more expensive memory that had the little, a little extra chip, a parity chip to make sure that the memory was doing its thing and it was accurate. You had the parity chip. Yeah. Eh, cost too much. Well, they don't. They work ninety percent of the time. Who cares? We don't. Oh, I didn't know anything about this. What What does this magical chip do? 
The magical chip, I think it can maintain. I'm not sure anymore. I used to know, but I think it maintains some like a check sum value for the what was in the memory itself, and if that, and it would check against it. Right, using a and if, if it got it, yeah, and if it got a different hash or a different check, so yeah, something, and then it was said, "Oh no, no, this is no good. This hmm. memory's gone bad," hmm. and uh, then we don't have that anymore. There's no reason for it because it's like the failure rate is so low, right, with the way things are that you don't care, and so you just let this <laughs> thing slide. And I think that's what happened with this. Instead of having a backup or redundant uh, network card, I'm pretty sure it does what it was from, from what I read. Yeah, it said uh, one they, network they just card. Just go. It's fine. <laughs> I was able to find a clip with uh, someone in charge over there at CenturyLink. For the first time since this outage, I was able to talk to someone from CenturyLink on camera just a short time ago. The bottom line here is that, well, yes, this system is back up and running. They still don't know exactly what went wrong, and they're trying to figure that out. What are you doing to make sure something like this doesn't happen again? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. That's not a, not great, a question. great question. So right now we feel very confident the system is stable. It's up and running. We don't anticipate any issues. Days after a 911 outage in Washington caused 4,500 calls to fail, CenturyLink, the telecommunications company responsible, says they're narrowing in on the problem but still can't tell us exactly what caused that six-hour failure. They know the outage was due to a technical error in a third-party vendor's call router. But when I asked what that technical error was, they said they don't know. So right now, we need to break down every point of contact between the 911 center in Washington or centers and the CenturyLink data centers as well to make sure we've exactly found the reason for the outage and how are we going to fix it and prevent it in the future. The Washington Emergency Management Division believes the 911 system is stable now, but it still wants assurances from CenturyLink. Something like this won't happen again. The thing about this clip is from 2014. (laughs) <laughs> and they were fined $16 million for it. No one told you that, huh? Second time this has happened with these guys. This is the problem with this architect, this microservices architecture, and he is probably right. I mean, I don't see how you get the thing back online without knowing what caused I just, the But problem. I just can't believe that this is from 2014, and now we're five years later, and it happens again. Exact, exact same thing. I'm sure it is the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a single point of failure and it failed again. Again. It apparently works for five years. <laughs> failed again. <laughs> failed Crank, again. Cranks away for five years and it stops working. I mean, this happens <laughs> if anyone has had a, you know, nowadays you, we start to see the evidence of this, of this, of our hardware issues in the uh, environment because when, when in the late 70s, eight, throughout the entire 80s and then pro- probably half of the 90s, we were buying brand new computers. At the rate of about one every year and a half. So if you had a computer, you had to get a new one every year and a half to two years. Two years is really keeping an old clunker alive right? because of all these new drivers and the new peripherals and all these other things. So you were buying and the new chips made a difference. So you were buying in the 80s for sure. You were buying a new computer every year and a half. But since most recently, we don't. The, the failure, you know, there's, there's nothing happening that's so important that we got to get a new computer. It's the same old Microsoft Office. It's the same old Intel chips. You know, you don't need to do any. So you keep the machines longer. And now we're starting to see that they do crap out. After about five years, most computers, if you have one old five-year-old computer, the likelihood of it blowing up is pretty high. And we're seeing that <laughs> Actually same exploding years. a real kinetic event? It actually happened once on one of mine. <laughs> a, capa- a capacitor blew up, and, and it sounded like a, a oh, bomb went yeah, off. Yeah, a, a cap gone will do it for you. Yeah, that'll but do it. But the point is, is that these machines don't last forever. No, and I think Apple's going to start putting more of that not lasting forever into their new devices because they got to do something. They got to get people upgrading. Well, they they're so slack on the Mac. They don't want to really. They're not doing enough work there, so they're not selling enough. And they, but they, I think with the iPhone, it just breaks co- constantly. I think most. I don't know anyone without a broken one. Well, you mean the glass? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the weakest part, or that's really their their main thing. That's. But I, you know, uh, I'm around a lot of millennials lately. Certainly in the Christmas break, they all got cracked screens. They don't care. Yeah. They're not not replacing. My screen's cracked. 
Maybe I'll go and get it fixed. Maybe not. As long as they can still see it. <laughs> it's just it's too expensive. Can't afford it. I don't know. And the next phone I'm getting, because my phone is finally getting pretty. Yeah, which one do you have? I still have a Nexus Galaxy. Nice. And the cool thing about it is you can take the back off and change the battery. Yes. Uh, but I think I'm going to get a Huawei. Why don't you just go for the E71, the Nokia, like I have? Uh, it, it fits your image. I think I already have one. You probably do. I have an original. It's such a good phone. Yeah, it was a good phone in its day. It's still a great phone. Yeah, it's got a nice keyboard. It's got a great keyboard. <laughs> we can go on like this forever. It's, it's, I've tried it's them all. It's got a nice finish. It's pretty. It does. I dropped it the other day, stepping out of the truck. Yeah? Yeah, nothing. You had, no. <laughs> the phone went, that all you got? But you had an instance in your past where you dropped a phone in the toilet. That was the very first iPhone. Now, that was, that was the if first you dropped iPhone. the E71 in the toilet, you think it would survive? Hell yeah. I don't know, with those buttons and the mechanics and that. Oh, yeah, sure. definitely. I've dropped E71s in the toilet before. I've dropped it in all kinds of stuff. It's an huh. indestructible foam. You know, the, uh, the Symbian OS is, has been open sourced. Someone could totally rejigger that for, for all kinds of different hardware. I don't know why somebody hasn't. Yeah. I used to write columns about this, you know, when somebody abandons things, sometimes they, yeah, you know, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. I mean, with the OS2, I always thought should have been put into the public domain by IBM. But apparently there's some, you know, the problem with doing that, there's some stuff that probably was like, maybe shouldn't be in there and they didn't want anyone seeing it. Who knows? Uh. Uh, but I think any, if you, if you abandon a product, I think you should push it into the public domain because I, a lot of people may have been reliant on the product. Yeah, Microsoft is doing a lot of that actually. They're they're you know a lot of their older stuff they're open sourcing. DOS six. <laughs> I'm telling you, Microsoft will run on Linux in our lifetime. Windows, <laughs> it'll be Windows on top of Linux. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming. It's possible. A uh, quick look in uh, this is now Act Eight. Of the yellow vests in France oh, yeah. we need to keep up with this. over the weekend. It has, oh, yeah, it's not the same amount of people. It's only 50,000 across the country. The majority at the in, uh, in Paris. It's the yellow vest movement's first round of protests in 2019. And many say they're determined to continue all year. On Saturday, at least 50,000 protesters came out across France for the eighth straight week of demonstrations. Though the protests remain largely peaceful in the morning, clashes with authorities broke out in multiple cities early on into the evening. In central Paris, rioters torched cars and set barricades on fire. Elsewhere in the capital, protesters launched projectiles at police officers, responded with tear gas. Now you remember Macron in his New Year's address, we played the clip. He said, oh, these are just the people who uh, hate the Jews, they hate the LGBT, they just hate these is horrible haters. Though the scale of the protests has decreased in recent... Did you like my Macron? was pretty good, huh? Recent weeks, I was just like a Lebanese merchant. <laughs> yellow vests have vowed to continue mobilizing, saying the government's recent concessions are not enough. We've been tightening our belts for 15, 20 years. We've had enough. We're still in an era of nobles and serfs in 2019. We've had enough of being dragged around by those in power who look down on us, who look down on the people who trample all over us. Of Macron, who says we're nothing, that we're a crowd full of hate, even though we've just shown that this demonstration was amazing, peaceful, that there was no trouble. In response to Saturday's tensions, Interior Minister Christophe Castaner held an emergency crisis response meeting in the capital and urged protesters to respect the rule of law. Now, I stand with the yellow vest, man. These guys are great. Those are patriots right there. Not giving up. Screw you. We, what do you say? We still live in the land of sirs and lords, yeah? I know. The French, don't, the French can only put up with so much. Yeah. And, they, and, I, and I know they won't quit. They will not quit. Ah, good on them. They probably won't quit, and this gonna, which brings... To, the, begs the question what's going to happen yeah i don't know it's not going to get prettier it's a, it's a thorn in the side of the eu they're going to have to i don't know this is not going to work out to, as far as i can tell hmm. bad things are going to happen
All right, you got one last one to get us out of here? You got anything? Well, first, I, before I get out of here, I did, want to say, I did put an Amy ISO together. I wanted to play that oh, so we can see okay. if it's any good. Yeah, I, I have the, this is what I was planning. Thank you for your courage. That's what I was planning as ISO of the day. Let's listen I, to I, Amy. I actually had that one. Oh, but it lost out to this one. Which the Trump administration unilaterally pulled out of last year. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's funny. But I like. Well, they did unilaterally. No, no, no. Nancy is is much more okay, pronounced. You're right, Nancy. Nancy, better. Nancy wins. Uh, I've got a thing on on the dairy industry being de-emphasized up in Canada, which nah. is a big deal. Nah. I have. Oh, there's another unreported thing. The Democracy Now report on uh, the Iranians are sending satellites up, and they think it's like a just a cheap trick to get their ballistic missile program yeah. together. Mm, yeah, uh, space force. I got a, a, a Canadian perspective was always good of the shutdown. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, go to dairy. Dairy's good. <laughs> We're doing dairy, people. Here comes all those New Year's resolutions to eat healthier, and soon there will be a new Canada food guide to help you along. It's something lots of us probably learned about in school and then maybe took for granted, but Health Canada has been working on an overhaul. It's coming in a few months, and today we're getting an idea of what could change. Draft copy recommends Canadians eat a variety of healthy foods each day. Pretty straightforward, right? But potentially the biggest change, dairy products may disappear as their own food group, instead lumped in with proteins. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't put yeah. my dairy in my proteins, people. Yeah. Uh, we love Ketchup you. Ketchup is a vegetable. We love you guys up there. And that wraps it up for today's deconstruction. Uh, I'll be watching the Globes tonight, see if there's anything there, see if anyone's really funny. I have low expectations. But uh, we yeah, will... We'll, yeah. we'll do a rundown. Yeah, we'll return on Thursday and we'll see if we can figure out what's going on with you all. So thank you for participating in the Value Network. Value for Value is what we're about. Remember us at dvorak.org slash na. And I'm coming to you from downtown Austin, Texas. This is the capital of the Drone Star State. It's in FEMA region number six, if you're looking for it on the governmental maps. If you're looking for me, I'm in the 5x9 Cludio in the Common Law Condo and say in the morning to you, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. I'm from northern Silicon Valley, where it is one of the few shows where it rained throughout the entire show. Unbelievable for California. We live in the desert. I'm John C. Dvorak. Uh, and want to thank Tom Starkweather, um, Matt Bash, and Sir Chris Wilson for our end of show mixes. Until Thursday, adios, mofos, and such. I just have this vision of you sitting in, up there in your office on the hill, watching the trains go by. It goes one now. Marking it down in your little notebook. I definitely had a little note calling and in, it into the calling in com- quarters every <laughs> once in a while. Calling in complaints. It was late. Well, I hear that Zephyr coming. It's rolling round the bend. We've started no agenda. It's late again, so I write it in my notebook and call up to complain. Cause I'm a closet foamer. For service, goats, and trains. Oh my god! Woo! Listen to that horn! Oh my god! Woo! Listen to that goat! Some people must just be thinking, what the hell are these guys doing? There are so many haters out there. Whatever's going on in the internet, don't pay attention to them. It's they everybody's have, putting out who's going to click on or who they're going to watch. Yeah, they don't we all have know a, that's the case. Yeah, they don't have a political bias other than cash. Frustration. The impression you get from the president that he would like to not only close government, build a wall, but also abolish Congress. But once you get to, like, the tippy tops... National parks are getting a bit messy as they're operating on a skeleton staff with limited resources, a.k.a. no restrooms or trash collection. Bathrooms are kind of a, a challenge, though. Calm down. You don't have the answers, though. Calm down. Because you're trying to give me advice about no, something. No, no, you no, ain't, no. You ain't got the answers. Mr. Trump also told lawmakers he didn't like the word shutdown. They has to give up a concrete wall and replace it with a steel fence in order to do that so that Democrats can say, see, he's not building a wall anymore. So, 
Well, that I don't know. You'd have to ask your psychiatrist. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the Mother Teresa. You'll find that it's divine might out boy. Told the president we needed the government open. He resisted. In fact, he said he'd keep the government closed for a very long period of time, months or even years. I did Where we are. That. Absolutely, I said that. Because steel is stronger than concrete, okay? In case you, you could check it out.